This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Hit record. I see recording. Yep. <laughs> Okay, I will call this planning board meeting to order. Welcome to the Amherst planning board meeting for June 3rd, 2020. Based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law GL chapter 30A section 20 and signed Thursday, March 12, 2020, this planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Christine Gray Mullen and as chair of the Amherst planning board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.33. This meeting, this meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken as normal. I will now take a roll call. Board members, if, as you hear your name called, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then please place yourself back on mute. Michael Burt Whistle. Here. Maria Chow. Here. Jeff Jemsek. Here. David Levenstein. Here. Doug Marshall. Here. Janet McGowan. Here. Board members, if technical difficulties arise, we may need to pause temporarily to rectify the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let Sean of IT or Pam know. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note if a disconnection has occurred. Please use the raise hands function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call upon you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself, please. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period, which is held towards the beginning of the meeting and at other appropriate times throughout the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment during the public comment period, you must join the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link. This link is shown on the slide and it can be entered into a search engine. The link can also be found on the meeting agenda, which is located on the town website in two ways. One is to go through the calendar listing uh, for this meeting, which is on the town homepage, and then find the link within the event details. A second way is to go to the planning board web page and click on the most recent agenda link. And on the agenda, there's a link towards the top of the page where it states virtual meeting. Um, which you will see the agenda in a few minutes. Uh, please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when the public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting via telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself stating your full name and address and put yourself back on mute when you're finished speaking. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If these guidelines are not complied with or the speaker exceed their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. Included on tonight's agenda, item four is a joint public meeting with the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council, known as CRC. The board and the CRC intend to discuss a plan for approaching zoning bylaw revisions. This item is expected to begin approximately at 7.45 p.m. Um, I also would like to note that um, under new business on our agenda is um, Article 14, uh, the temporary bylaw that's being discussed right now. Um, and we will have Q&A for planning board members only and not the public at this time. The public will have uh, time to comment on this and they're always welcome to send in emails. Um, and uh, that will be coming up at our next meeting. And uh, we will also have another um, uh, area where we're discussing uh, another possible bylaw on uh, planning board voting requirements. Um, and that also will not be taking public comment tonight due to time because we have an extremely full agenda and um, we wanna get through it all tonight. Hopefully in less than four hours, right everybody? Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to move to the agenda. Uh, we see it there on the screen. 
Uh, we can see the virtual meeting link. Uh, the first item is minutes, but we have no minutes is my belief. And um, I'm just pulling up attendees so I can see any possible hands because I'm going to move to item two, which is the public comment period. So at this time, um, you can speak on something that is either um, not going to be discussed tonight or it's an item being discussed tonight that is not receiving public comment. Um, right now I see nothing, but I do, Pam, see two phone call-in listeners. Uh, yes. I assume they do not have their hands up. I do not see their hands up, nope. Okay, great. So we're gonna move to item three now. Public hearing, site plan review. Uh, we have two of them tonight. I'm gonna go to the first one and read the preamble. Uh, do I have enough? Yes, we do. It's uh, We're set for 635 and I have 638. So in accordance with the provisions of MG, L, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding. SPR 2020-09, All About Learning, LLC, 7 Pomeroy Lane, Units 1 through 5. Request site plan approval to expand the existing play area to accommodate tenant lease area expansion and to approve the expansion of the preschool into units one, two, three. Um, sorry, uh, three, map 20C29 BVC zoning district. Uh, Chris, I just want to call on Chris Bestrip. Are you there? I just got a phone call from her. Pam, do you know what's going Can you hear me, Chris? Oh. Uh-oh. Okay. Where did the Zoomy thing go? That's weird. Is she, can you tell her to, to come back in? Hmm. Hello? She's here. She's texting me, I think. I cannot hear Christine. Oh, she cannot Hello. hear Christine. Oh, this is weird. Hello. 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 Yeah, hi, yeah, this is Dwight Scott calling into the meeting. Oh, okay, great, Dwight. We're trying to get Christine back in. I think I'm here. I have no idea what happened. She cannot hear me either. Can you hear me? I'm here. And is Chris there? Let me look at the connection. I can hear you, Christine. Alan Sharp. I can hear you. Can someone text Christine Breast. Alan, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. She's trying to call Hi, me. Chris. Yeah. Oh well. I will go out and come back in. Try yes. that. All right. Okay. Chris, something Chris, yeah you can hear me though i can hear you and see me chris was saying she could not hear anybody strange and my zoom screen just disappeared i it left the viewing panel up but the um presentation disappeared so i don't know what happened but we'll give her just a moment here um so could you hear me read the preamble are we good there okay thanks. i, I heard you read the preamble yes uh, Chris isn't here, but I will ask the board. Are there any board member disclosures? And I'm looking at hands, four hands. I don't see any. Um, so we'll give Chris a moment here. I'm here. Great, great. Chris. Welcome back. We're going to have the applicant's presentation. Um, and who do we have to speak for all about learning? We have Alan Sharp, and yeah. I think we have Dwight, Dwight Scott is going to speak for us. And I think is um, is Judy on the line because she was having trouble earlier. Is Judy Wilder on the line? Can Judy is here as an attendee. She is there, she Chris? Is, and she's got her hand up. I'm going to actually move her into a panelist. All right. Thank you. So, and there's three phone numbers in the attendees. Are any of those? I don't know who those people are. Are those public that, or any of you? Like, is one Dwight? I know Dwight was on. I heard him earlier. So. 
Yep, I don't know where he went. Oh, is this him? Can Hello? <laughs> Can you Nine, hear me? Nine seven eight five four four two seven seven that's, three. Yeah, that's Judy. That's Judy. Okay. And Dwight, it should be four seven eight three nine one three. Do you see that? I'm no. here, I guess. I guess. Because I, I just heard him a minute ago. No, I do not see Dwight. He was here. I'm on Zoom. Good luck, guys. <laughs> this is wonderful. I will ask the members of the board to mute themselves because sometimes when there's a lot of feedback like that, if more people get off the system. Did um, you see Dwight come back? I'll call Dwight. Oh, here he is. Oh, Dwight. he's back. Okay, good. I'm going to promote him to panelists. Great. He's back. Let's see if he makes it over there. <laughs> yes. Dwight, can you hear? Dwight, you need to unmute. Wait, let's, uh, yeah, unmute him. Yeah, I've unmuted him. <laughs> Dwight Scott, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Welcome. Okay. So we're at that part. I don't know if you've been watching, but uh, we are at the point where the applicant can um, give a presentation on what's going on with this SPR for All About Learning. OK, I'm having a real hard time hearing you for some reason. Here, hold on. Can you hear me better now? Uh, it's real. It's real. I'm trying to adjust mine volume here. All right, I'm going to listen as close as possible. Go ahead. Okay, we're at the point. Uh, where we listen to the applicant talk about their application for the SPR. For, and okay. Then, so if you, and if there's anything you'd like up on the screen, a certain um, drawing or. Uh, I can show you what I have. I have this. Can you see the screen? Which these yeah, that, that would be fine. Um, so we we are uh, applying for, um, all about learning. Uh, it's a daycare center that's uh, going to expand into um, uh, spaces one, two, and three. And by doing so, it's prompting that we have a larger play area in the rear. And so we're going to uh, 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 accommodate them by doubling the size of the play area uh, by basically lengthening the same cross section of the play area that's there now down to the uh, west end of the building. That's basically what we're uh, applying for. If we can notice there's, yeah, that, where you're pointing now, that's the new play area that's proposed. Okay. And, and connecting to the old play area, it says existing play area, existing sand play area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I believe um, this all came to the planning board back in 2016. Uh, so a lot of this is an expansion of what it was already approved and has been in existence. This is because you're expanding um, into uh, is another two units, which you can see their unit, um, which are the ones are moving one and what are the new units? One, two, and three. Okay, and you were in four and five. So uh, a lot of this is expanding that play area, expanding fences, and adding gates um, for the safety of transporting the children from the building to the play that, area. That's correct. Um, at this point, we could uh, go to the site visit. I think I had, uh, I think David volunteered to give a site visit report. Sure. Um, well, a healthy crew from the planning board met our leaders, 
Christine and Chris at 7 Pomeroy Lane, where we met Judy Wilder and Mr. Scott, Ms. Wilder and Mr. Scott. Um, as described, it's, it's fairly straightforward. It's a seven unit building with a parking lot right at this, at a, the uh, Pomeroy West Street intersection. Um, the alert, uh, the children's, uh, the daycare center wants to expand three additional units and have the play area in behind the building, um, uh, expand the length of the building to the, to the west end to the, to the, I, I assume unit one. Um, and we saw the gates, we saw the, 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 we discussed with the applicant, the concern raised by the fire department, and that seems to be addressed by the way in which the gates are able to move both directions. And that looks like they're going to level off the area. There's a hill towards getting, moving toward what, towards the Western end of the street. And um, they'll address that in, in uh, with, with whatever they need to with the fill, I assume. Um, but, that, and that's about it. There's no, is, there were no apparent issues on the front end of the building. This is concentrated on the back end of the building as I understand. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, at this time, I see Judy's hand up. Uh, Judy, would you like to speak and add something to the applicant's uh, presentation? I do see your hand up, but I don't know if you actually want to speak. All right, her hand is down, so maybe she's all set. Um, okay, so at this point, I'm going to take question up. Oh, Judy's hands back up. Would you like to speak, Ms. Wilder? Can we unmute her, Pam? I'm I'm trying. For some reason, I can't. It doesn't seem to be. Up oh, is that better? Yes. yes. Welcome, Judy. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hate computers, guys. Um, You're what, doing what Dwight great. said is perfect. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> what, what? Thank you. What Dwight said is perfect. I don't have anything to add unless you have any questions. Wonderful. At this point, then, we will move to the board um, and any questions they have. I'm watching for raised hands. Um, does anyone have any questions that the board would like to ask the applicants or Ms. Bestrup um, about this project? Um, I see no hands at this time. Um, I can move to public comment. I will move to attendees. Um, I do see two hands up. Pam, do you have any idea who those two hands are or should I, we just bring them online? I think we should just go ahead and give them the opportunity um, and just remind them to say who they are. Okay, so well, uh, how about the, uh, great. Oh. So uh, 9639, could you please uh, announce yourself with your name and address? My name is Craig Cody. I live at 500 West Street and I am the uh, president of the Courtyard Condominium Association. And that is to the south, just south of the, um, <clears throat> this site? That's correct. Okay, welcome. Do you have a question or concern? No, just a comment in terms of um, <clears throat> Dwight and I have had a very amicable relationship over the past three or four years and uh, we have no opposition to the expansion. And I know that um, if I had any concerns that I could uh, directly address them with Dwight. Um, I'm pleased to hear that there'll be the leveling off part of it because that will actually help expedite the drainage. Great. So it's just more, more to um, chime in and advocate for Dwight and just thank him for being a good budding neighbor. Wonderful to hear. Property management. And thank okay. you for making the effort um, thank to you, come Craig. to our meeting and tell us that. Mm -hmm. No problem. Thanks, Dwight. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> Appreciate it. You're welcome. So yeah. at this time, we'll move to uh, Pam. You've got, it's a 7163 number. 
Uh, I believe you're almost there. I can still see. Uh, can you hear me? I unmuted them. Okay, you should be able to speak now. Welcome. Uh, please announce yourself and give your street address. Yes, hi, my name is Tony Wenceski. I'm the engineer on the project working with Dwight, Allen, and Judy. I work for FCE Associates in Brattleboro, Vermont, and um, just on the line in case there were any technical issues that needed to be answered. But my client, Dwight, did a very good job. So thank good you. Good to know that you're here. Thank you for coming. So uh, I see no other hands in attendees. I will go back to panelists. Um, I see Janet McGowan's hand up. I call on Janet. Hi, um, I just have a few questions. Um, um, on the, you're asking for a waiver of the lighting plan and I noticed on the development application report that you have exterior lighting um, from dusk to 2 a.m. Is, is that lighting in the front parking lot or behind the building or both? It's both. And then the follow-up question is why, why are the lights on so late? Is that, that seems unusual to me, but just curious. Um, it's, that's been something that was a design, that a, a, a uh, uh, way that we wanted to do it ever since we uh, in, constructed the building. And um, it, it hasn't seemed to be a problem. We, we have that back kind of, um, uh, area back alleyway that goes down the building. We wanted that to be lit at least until 2 a.m. Okay. Um, and another question I had was, um, are you, on your site plan, it says that the new play area will be grass surface. Is that going to be grass or is that going to be converted to sand like the rest of the um, playground? It should be sand. Um, it's going to follow the original uh, design that is there existing. Okay. And then my last question is about how cars come in and out of the lot for a drop off. Like do They're in the front of the building, um, right at the Pomeroy. Uh, it's the first turn in from prominent from on Pomeroy Lane from the intersection. So like every kid gets dropped off like in front of the building and then they pull out from the different that, that's correct. Okay. That, those are my questions. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, I see. I'm going to call on Judy. You have your hand up. Would you like to say something? The question got answered. Uh, I'm all set. Wonderful. Chris Bestrup, I see your hand is up. I just wanted to point out that there is a development application report for those of you who didn't have a chance to read it. I sent it out about five o'clock this evening, but I think that Janet um, did ask some of the questions that I suggested. So that's all I had to say. Okay. Um, I will ask again to the board, anyone else have any questions on this? I don't see any. Up, oh, Doug Marshall. I call on Doug. Yeah, uh, I guess I'm asking a question I should have asked when you wanted, uh, or you asked for any disclosures. I think I, I do want to just state for the record that through my professional work at UMass, I know uh, Alan and Dwight uh, from some of the interactions we've had with them uh, as a university. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Um, so, Chris, you have your hand up. Do you have something to say, or should I? Yeah, no. Okay. So I see no hands up, and um, if there's no, oh, David, David I mm -hmm. see David's hand. So, is this where we? I make a motion to close the public hearing, and to vote on the application. We Put can do second. that at this time. Uh, uh, so I'd like to close the poll. I'd like to move to close the public hearing and to approve the uh, uh, site plan review application for all about learning. And do I see a second hand to second that motion? I second that. Okay, I hear Michael. 
So it's been second. Um, are there any other final comments or questions? Uh, we have a motion on the table. Um, David, your hand is up if you have a question. And I also then recognize Chris. Okay, I'm moving to Chris. So I just wanted to suggest that you um, make reference to the criteria um, that you find that the uh, application meets all of the re relevant criteria of section 11.24. Of the zoning bylaw, I is I believe that is that in the development application here. It is not. It's just a standard thing. We usually go through all of the criteria, but this is such a small project that um, sometimes with small projects you just make that blanket statement about uh, that this project meets all of the relevant criteria of the um, site plan review criteria list. Then please include that. And um, I just, the only conditions or what findings that I remember from the site visit was that they have air conditioning units in the back of the building that the ones that have been impacted so far, they put coverings on. And there's like three more units for this one through three uh, that would need to be covered. And I do believe the fire uh, department weighed in on this and there was two new gates that need to be put in that need to swing outward. But I do believe the applicant said that they'll be similar to the gates that exist and they swing in and out. Anything else, anybody? Uh, I don't see any hands. So if we're ready, we could take a vote at this time. Um, and I can do a roll call. So first uh, I will call on Michael Burtwistle. Someone's getting a call. <laughs> Michael, did I hear from you? Uh, I approve, I'm trying to, uh, can you hear me? Now I can hear you. I heard approve. <laughs> Thank you. Maria. Approve. Jack. Approve. David. Approve. Doug. Approve. Janet. Approve. And I also approve. Unanimous seven. Thank you so much. Good luck. Um, all about learning. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Have a great night. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Right. Okay. All right. So, uh, just give me one moment here to get organized. Just means throw things on the floor. Okay. So we will move to the next site plan review. Uh, which was a, uh, on our agenda for 6.45. It is now seven o'clock. And in accordance with provisions MGL chapter 40A, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2020-10, the Common School, 521 South Pleasant Street, request site plan approval to repave the existing driveway and pave and reconfigure the existing gravel parking and turnaround drop off area, including the emergency drive, walkways and other site improvements. Map 17A-78RN zoning district. First off, I'm watching for hands. Do we have any board member disclosures? And I see no hands, so I will move to the applicant's presentation. Uh, just Pam, I do believe I saw. We have Mike. Michael. Can, yeah, is, does he need to be? He should be over in the panelists now, ready to go. Uh, you, oh, there you are, Michael. Hello, can, Michael. Can the board hear me? We can, but okay, please great. fully introduce yourself and let the public know who you are and who you represent. All right. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, my name is Michael Liu. I'm with the Berkshire Design Group. Uh, we are landscape architects and civil engineers, um, and we have um, worked with the common school in the past on some smaller projects. Um, with us tonight should be Kevin Campbell. Is I don't know if Kevin's on the line I or on video. Him. I can move him over. 
Um, His hand is up, so oh, yes. He is here, okay. I'm um, going to move him to panelist. <laughs> is there anyone else? I can't seem to, I need to decrease um, the screen here on my home computer so I can access my thumb drive. And I can't seem to alter the screen. Mike, I have some oh. slides. Okay, we can, okay, great. Um, I I do have another graphic to show um, at the end, but we can do look at uh, maybe sheet L one, yeah that one. Okay. To start. Um, I also have a nice color rendering that I was going to use. Um, I should have sent that over to you. Um, but I can I can tr oh I know. If you can pull share them up screen. on your screen, you can okay, share on. your screen. Okay. If you uh, prefer. And it should give you the option what to select. Right. Whoops. Oh, that looks good. <laughs> well, that is just an area. Okay. Well, why don't I start with that and see if I can yeah. jump to the color rendering. So this is an aerial view of the site. Um, we had a site meeting. I think most or the majority of the planning board members were present um, the other day. But if you uh, look at the site, it doesn't, this doesn't show the property lines, but the main parcel for the common school looks something like a big, um, big dipper <laughs> with the small end being here at the entry road at South Pleasant Street. The driveway is currently paved from South Pleasant Street to about the start of this gravel turnaround. Um, the roadway or driveway is becoming cracked and there's several potholes and it's in need of some repair. Um, the gravel turnaround here has always been somewhat of a problem in that, you know, it's, it, it needs routine maintenance. Um, cars are driving on it. There's no designated spaces to park. So, you know, there's, there's no, um, there, sometimes it's unclear if people you know are gonna they pull in they might take up two spaces when they really should only be taking up one etc cetera, etc cetera. the handicapped parking is not clearly demarcated with striping right here closest to the buildings um, and then there's an the issue of people um, bringing dust into the buildings that has been a continuous problem you know over the years so this uh, project proposes to repave the driveway in its present width pave um, the turnaround and parking spaces which are located on the east and south side of the turnaround with a handicap here at the southwest end of the turnaround. Additionally, we're proposing to pave a um, emergency access drive, which um, you can see is kind of existing as an existing condition. It's located in this area. Um, in the worn, worn grass, and there's a bunch of old tree stumps in this area. We showed the um, emergency drive being paved in this area with a small, um, a widened area for the dumpster. Um, as you may know, currently when you enter the site, the dumpsters are located right here at the corner, at the end of the paved area, right before you get into the, into the turnaround. And, you know, that's visually unsightly and it's not a very welcoming feature into the uh, into the property um, and that moving the dumpsters from here to this location will also help the maintenance staff bring the uh, refuse recyclables and litter and what have you you know to that location from the buildings rather than having to walk out and you know all the way across the gravel drive to this location um, so it's a convenience and also it would improve the safety of, of that function um, I want to get to the paving. Uh, as you can see from the aerial, the, the gravel is kind of has no real defined limit. It does move around. So the paving will help keep that, um, the impervious area uh, well defined. Um, the proposed paving will not go beyond the existing limits of where the gravel is now and in the center the green space will be increased. Um, and in the center, our engineers had des have designed a rain garden feature um, so that basically the turnaround, 
the new paving of the turnaround will all be pitched inward to the rain garden. So runoff will be uh, flowing into the rain garden where it can infiltrate and be treated. And there is an existing catch basin, which is currently in the gravel, but will now be within the green space of the rain garden. And that will function as an overflow um, from f f after you know the water uh, has been treated. And if it gets up to a level, I believe it's the, the depth of the rain garden is about eight and a half inches. So once it reaches, <coughs> excuse me, that elevation, any overflow will enter the catch basin and it basically exits to the south here at the south side of this fenced in garden area. Um, we have presented the plans to the Conservation Commission last week um, and we talked about the runoff and, and stormwater treatment and they, they have approved of the project already. Um, and then the one other thing I wanted to mention is that um, we didn't I didn't talk about this at the site walk, but we are also proposing to pave this walkway, which comes up from the parking area into the courtyard of the school and this um, gravel walk now. So right now, this is gravel, this is gravel, and this walkway that runs down back to the um, turnaround is gravel. We're proposing to pave this uh, from the parking lot, basically from the um, end of the handicap spaces up into the courtyard and into the buildings in a flush condition so that we have um, improved and maintained handicap accessibility. So obviously right now it's gravel. So again, they're doing the maintenance on it with, with more stone dust and gravel and, you know, having to do that continually. Um, you, know, you know, it costs a lot of money over the years as well as all the uh, time put in uh, from a maintenance point of view. Um, in the application, we are asking for a waiver from uh, sign uh, plan, um, lighting plan, and the traffic um, um, impact report. Um, nothing is changing here with respect to the student or faculty population. Um, so the traffic is will be remain uh, remain as it is currently. Um, there's no change proposed to the lighting. Um, there are lights along the west side of this existing parking lot, which is on a separate parcel. And then there's um, additionally, I think there's five lights that run along this sidewalk, which is under the trees, but parallel to the driveway and into um, um, this area. So the lighting has functioned well through, you know, for the, so many years, there's no change to that. And then there's no change to the signage on the property either. Um, we will be adding handicap um, plaques at the parking spaces and likely though they'll, they'll um, uh, replace the existing worn out wooden like one way signs. I believe once you enter this turnaround area, there's a there's a sign with an arrow that points, you know, one way to the to the right to keep you moving in uh, counterclockwise flow. <clears throat> um, but other than that, um, I'm not sure if I have anything else to present to you tonight. Kevin, I don't know if you wanted to say anything. Um, I know that we had um, an issue come up with the lot coverage. Uh, there was a restriction on this parcel, which differs from the zoning. Um, and um, I don't do, do you, I, I can pause now if you want to cover. Pam, any can questions. you, un, I'm sorry, excuse me. Pam, can you unmute um, Kevin, Ke Kevin Campbell? I, I'm, I'm here. Great. Me, I unmuted myself. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, Mike, I, I think you should feel free to, to speak to um, uh, the issue of, of the lot coverage and the proposed you know, resolution. Okay. I forgot to jump to this color plan, but this maybe depicts um, the limits of paving, et cetera, a little bit more clearly. Um, so, we found out late in the game that there is a restriction on the main parcel for the common school, which is shown in this red line. Um, but actually, for the, for the exact parcel that the restriction applies to, it um, it only applies to this 50 foot width of the driveway. This other 50 foot width was added to the main parcel um, when the common school sold off this 
uh, what we call the McKenna parcel. McKenna's were the previous owners, but they retained a 50 foot strip so that they could maintain this barn. Um, but the restriction in the deed is clearly describes this, um, you know, big dipper shaped parcel without this extra 50 foot strip. So in looking at um, that main parcel, the coverage requirement or limit was 25%. By zoning in this district, it's 30%. So we had prepared this plan and we thought we were doing a great job by keeping the coverage to, um, it's up in the table, I can't quite read it, but 26.7% yeah, mm -hmm. um, on the entire parcel shown in red. Um, I went back and looked at um, what it would take to get the main parcel here in compliance with the 25% and basically came up with um, the, the number of 5,089 square feet that we need to reduce in pavement, which is substantial. It's a very significant amount. Um, and I'm gonna jump to another plan here that you haven't seen yet. Um, so the areas highlighted in purple, um, we are proposing to change those to permeable paving. And I can show you some images, but basically it's an con open concrete block that's set on um, crushed stone so it has good drainage. It can support vehicle weight. And then the voids are filled with um, topsoil and seeded. So you get a 50% of, of the area being green. Um, and I can show you pictures of that. And that doesn't quite get us up to that 5,089 um, square feet, but basically we were proposing that the parking spaces turn into permeable paving, but not the handicap spaces here. And then this section of um, emergency drive turn into permeable paving. And then additionally, we needed another 1,040 square feet or so, which is represented by this green strip. Currently this strip was paved and there's like, I think there's six um, parallel parking spaces. Um, we would have to basically eliminate that amount of paving and turn it back into a green strip. Um, it's hard to tell here, but this, this uh, little dot, dotted area is the paved driveway. And then the space to the north of that is, is a grass strip. And then to the north of the grass strip is the paved sidewalk that continues all the way into this area. So we would return that portion to grass um, and that would get us to 24.9% coverage on the main parcel that's described in the deed. So I know that um, we didn't have a chance to talk about this beforehand because our site visit was only two days ago or whatever, but um, we're we're asking that the board entertain the idea of using the permeable pavers to uh, count as essentially green space. Um, if, if, if that's acceptable, this plan would work. If it isn't acceptable, then um, I'm not sure it would be worth doing any of this if they had to eliminate all the parking, for instance, because the whole point of this is trying to organize some of the parking up near the school buildings because um, even though they have this lot, it's, it's not really used on a daily basis for parents to park and walk their kids all the way into the building, for instance. Um, and that's what essentially the, what they would have to do um, to make it work if there wasn't any parking. Either that or people would be all jammed up, you know, in here in a queue and it would be you know, complete chaos with people trying to park and run into the building versus people that just want to pull in, pick up their kids or drop off their kids and pull out, et cetera. So there's just too much conflict going on in there. Um, unfortunately, this site suffers from the fact that it has a very long entry road that, you know, takes up a lot of the uh, necessary lot coverage. Um, and they're already, I should note that in an existing condition, this site, the main parcel is already at, I believe it was 
one or 0.2 percent coverage so right as it stands right now it's already over that 25 percent um, limit so for whatever reason that was forgotten about over the years and things happen incrementally and we're at the point now where you know we're at 29 percent coverage um, so it's it's difficult to go back um, but this is a way to do it and still be able to um, make these improvements for the school. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, at this time, I see Chris Bestrup has her hand up, so I'm going to call on her. She might have something to add from the town's perspective. Chris, are you there? Yeah, I just want to say a couple of things um, that the town, uh, the zoning bylaw limits the coverage to less than 30 percent. And it's the deed restriction that limits the coverage to less than 25%. So really the conservation commission and the town as a whole is, you know, has interest in um, meeting the requirements of the deed restriction. The planning board would be potentially more focused on the zoning bylaw. But we do have Dave Zomek here in the wings. He's one of the attendees and he's the director of conservation and development. And I've spoken with him about this issue, and I think he would like to make a comment. I'm gonna... Oops. I'm looking for him. I'm, I'm promoting oh, him. Oh, I see, he's in attendees, okay. He should be over there, yes. Welcome, David. Hello. Hi. Uh, Hello. Oh, Hi, nice. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Um, well, I caught most of uh, Mike Liu's presentation. Yes, I, I think I think Chris's previous comment captured uh, a, 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 an important distinction between the zoning requirements and the requirements of the deed restriction. And I think the deed restriction really falls the the enforcement and and follow up to the deed restriction. It, it really runs to the town and more to, I think, the Conservation Commission, if you will. Um, so I appreciate that uh, Kevin and Mike uh, are now aware of it. It has some, it, it has been something that has come up through the years. So um, I think, you know, there may be some institutional memory, you know, at the common school that maybe have been lost over time, but it, yeah. it has been a prominent feature of the site for many, many years. Um, I guess I appreciate where Mike is going with this. Um, I had one question, and that is with the with the emergency fire access, um, I think if I'm looking at the, that's to the north of the building in purple. Um, yep. That's currently not paved. It is currently um, beat up grass, <laughs> right. um, or lack of grass. Um, so, I'm just curious how how are you seeing that as contributing to, with permeable paving? Uh, right now, it's right now it's not contributing to the common school being over the 25 percent. So, right, how does that help you we, get well, the percentage down? Yes, it would. It would uh, yeah. definitely help reduce the percentage by a few, um, maybe even 1%, I don't know, or maybe even 1.1%. Um, but I don't think we, it would, um, I don't know how close it would be to that 25. Um, but actually, it's, it's currently permeable, so I'm not following. Yeah, if, if, I, if, if we were to leave it alone, um, mm -hmm. I, I could take a look at the numbers again. I know after talking with Michael Roy, the fire safety officer, that they would like to ha have some type of emergency access along the north side of the building that's mm -hmm. better than what is there now. Um, no, I understand uh, if I could through the chair. Um, okay. I understand that. My question is more I don't understand how that helps. Uh, it's currently permeable. So right. if it's cur currently permeable, I understand the fire department would like to see that access and I'm not, I'm not disputing that. 
but how does that help you get the percentage down from 29 point something down to 24.9? Mike? Uh, yeah, oh, Mike. Oh, go ahead. Mike, I just, I, I mean, I'm sure you're hearing this, but at the, at the end of the NOI hearing is when Dave, you know, brought this to our attention because you had noted the 26.7% uh, you know, calculation of coverage, and and in, in in light of that, it was a reduction. Okay, and so I think what what Dave is trying to grapple with, and and I'd like you to explain, is that is that the plan itself, absent your pervious alterations here, includes a paved emergency access road, which 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 had pushed which pushed the um, coverage up, right? And now you're removing that. Right, because in an, what, the, what this paving plan does in defining the pavement, we're actually taking away impervious area from the turnaround area, and we were able to provide an emergency access drive in this configuration. And now we're looking at that condition and peeling it back to 25% or less. Okay. We're yeah. taking it back to so, so service. Yeah, it, in, it, by defining the paving and, and increasing the green space in the center of the turnaround and also on the perimeter or periphery edges of that gravel mess, we were able to save enough in, uh, on the impervious area to you know, allow for this much of a, um, a, a emergency, paved emergency drive. So that, that, that was a benefit, also another benefit of doing the paving project was we could get closer to satisfying, you know, the fire department's um, desires to have a, you know, access on the north side there. I see. But just to be clear, all the area in purple only counts as 50% coverage when you're doing your calculation. Well, that's what we need to figure out with you or, you know, maybe conservation on is how we count this um, if we have to if we have to look at the exact um, configuration of the block and open space void versus solid ratio that I haven't done I'm counting the the, the entire area shown in purple as being um, um, permeable pavers Perme right mm -hmm. And that's what pushed the number down to 24.9, right. along with right. the new green strip that runs along the north. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I hey, would, David, do you have any more questions? Or no, I guess, I guess I would end by saying, and I would defer to you, Christine. Um, it seems to me that that the the lot coverage issue is is related but somewhat separate. And I wonder if that's something that uh, the applicant should work through with the town and, and or the conservation commission um, in a parallel discussion, I'm not sure. Um, and, and I would look to you or, or, or Christine Brestrup on that, but it seems to me that that, that deed restriction is, uh, is to the town, so the town has the obligation to make sure that that is adhered to. Um, so I, I, I'm just curious how the planning board sees that. Well, how does, uh, Chris, how does the planning board see that if the zoning um, restriction is 30%, I mean, all of this is moot below that, um, is this critical to our decision about the deed? So my hand is up and I'm going to speak. Um, I would say that uh, if the plan is, what, what you want to come to is you want to approve a plan that's going to be built. And if there's going to be a conversation um, outside of the planning board meeting with conservation commission or staff that's going to change this plan, then I think you would want to wait until uh, the final plan has been developed before you approve a plan. So I would recommend that you continue the public hearing to a date certain and then um, have Mike and Kevin 
work this out with Dave Zomek and the Conservation Commission, and then come back to you with a plan that's satisfactory to the CONCOM. And, you know, I would say, I would pretty much guarantee then it would be satisfactory to the planning board with regard to lot coverage. That seems um, sensible and I agree with that. Um, so what I would do this evening is we'd finish some of this. I'll do the site visit report and I will take if the board does have some questions at this time so that the applicants can go off and finalize this and then it can come back to us. So um, thank you so far, you all. And I will at this point move to the site visit report, which I believe Jack was going to report on. Yes. So uh, a number of us met, uh, same group that was um, at the All About Learning uh, visit. And we uh, congregated near where the proposed rain garden is. Um, and you know, discuss the project. Um, the there, you know, there is a catch basin there right now that uh, adjacent to where the rain garden uh, is, and uh, so that would be removed, and you know, the rain garden would allow infiltration within that central area, that the depression area there. Um, we just talked about um, how the pavement right now is a sand, uh, kind of a gravel pack. Um, you know, uh, as it moves beyond where the straight driveway is coming up from, from uh, South Pleasant. And, um, and we talked about permeable pavers there. And I think it's a great, I think what well, Mike came up here since, since the time we were there, I, that looks really good. Um, um, but the, the, there is, you know, we were asking, you know, why this or why that, but I think the common school, is it okay to talk about why we're, you know, paving versus trying to do something like permeable pay or the permeable pavers everywhere is because I think there's a, there's a, there's a cost, real, a huge cost uh, savings for the yeah, common yeah. school. So that, you know, that, that makes complete sense for, for, for a school of this nature. So and then we cast our eyes on that, you know, emergency area that the turnout, uh, which is, I think there's a big stump right there. So I don't think it's ever been functional, <laughs> uh, but that stump will be removed. They talked about lowering the grade um, uh, to improve access to the rear of the building. Um, but again, here proposed, um, you have the permeable pavers and that, that, that's, you know, definitely intriguing. Um, I think that's about it. Yeah, thanks. The only thing I'm gonna add is about the dumpsters that I do oh, yeah. think it would be, we noted that they're, they're at the corner of the long driver when it um, hangs left, it all sits where there's now gonna be a parking spot. Um, and they're very visible. And um, like I think the applicant said earlier, they're far from the door. So moving that all over to that, um, emergency driveway would be practical and aesthetically pleasing. Um, at this point, I'll take, well, I'm gonna call on Chris and then uh, raise your hand board members if you have any questions at this time you wanna ask and then we can finish this up. Chris? So I just wanted to note that I think um, the catch basin is actually gonna stay there. It's not gonna be removed. You but are. it will be um, placed within the island and it will be able to, it'll be raised up a bit above the bottom of the rain garden and it will be able to catch overflow drainage um, in the rain garden. So it's, it's really going to stay in its place. It's just that the paving is going to move away from it and rain garden is going to be created around it. Yeah, it will actually function better. And I think I remember at the site visit, um, the applicants talking about how the school was actually excited to have this rain garden and it was actually going to be an educational point right on site that um, would help be a real world example of um, surface water drainage. So uh, at this time I only see um, Janet McGowan's hand up so I will call on Janet for a question. Hi, um, thank you. I have a few questions. I do want to say at the outset that I really like the idea of the rain garden and especially involving the kids in that. 
that seemed like a great improvement. Um, I also in support um, having the planning board helping um, make decisions that preserve the conservation restriction. I think it's very important for the town. Um, and this to me, at my first look, um, maybe not so educated look, um, looks like a good solution to what looks like an accidental violation of the conservation restriction. Um, the questions I have, um, one for the Conservation Commission is, does the Conservation Commission agree with the idea of um, creating, counting 50% um, of the permeable pavers as green space? Does that make sense to them? Do they accept that? Do they think that's a good idea? Um, questions for the applicants I have. Um, I know at the site visit, um, Mr. Liu had said that, um, you know, even though the road the roadway, I mean, at the roadway, the turnaround is gravel, that's considered permeable. And I was wondering is if all kinds of, if all types of gravel roads are considered impermeable. Um, and then does the fire department need a per, impermeable road? You know, could, the, could, could they accept either soil or maybe a heavier gravel that lets more water in? So those are just um, back questions I'd love to have answered now. Thank you. Um, so, in the town of Amherst, um, this type of pavement, gravel paving, is considered impervious. So it, it's to be counted against the lot coverage or toward, you know, toward the lot coverage, whichever yeah. way you want to right. look at it. So um, that's what we've always had to do with, you know, on, on all the projects in Amherst. Um, the, with respect to the fire lane, I, I think I, I've spoken with Michael Roy. I think the fire department's willing to help to find ways of creating something that's more accessible than what is there now. Mm. Part of the problem is the steep slope, as you yeah. may recall, once you get, you know, it, they actually say they, they can't get their trucks up that little incline. So we're proposing to take the grade down and flatten that out a little bit so it'll be easier. Um, but when it comes to a surface, they need a stable surface that will support the weight of a fire truck, the heaviest fire apparatus in town. Um, I don't know if what's out there now complies. I, I doubt it does, even though it's like, you know, much of it is devoid of grass. It's a lot of stones and dirt and, you know, patches of grass or whatever. You know, I mean, how often does a fire truck need to, is a fire truck going to pull up there? I, I can't say, you know, but in the situation that a fire truck needs to get access closer to the building, they need a stable surface and one that's going to support the fire truck. So their preference is to have something hard um, that's designed specifically for you know the weight of the vehicle. Uh, we can achieve that with the with the concrete permeable paver system on a good crushed stone base, um, which serves two functions, to support the, the top concrete pavers as well as provide drainage or, or infil, you know, creation capacity through the stone. Um, so that's, I think that's a win-win, a, a so, so to speak, using this type of system there. Um, plus the fact that you're, you know, you're not going to have a blacktop surface or, or concrete or, or whatever or anything. It's going to be, it's going to have the appearance of being mostly green if the grass grows well, if it's taken care of. Um, right. So actually that's, you know, that's, I guess the third benefit is visually, it appears to be green. I agree with the stabilization. Uh, those ladder trucks, when they move out the stabilizers, they need a solid surface to, you know, push off of too. So, um, yeah, so you'll continue to work with the fire department yeah, and the town. Yeah. They understand the nature of this yeah. site and it's it's a difficult thing to you know achieve i mean ultimately i think what the fire code almost makes you do is provide a loop around these buildings yeah. and that's that's impossible so the fire department's willing to uh work with the school to come up with a solution that they you know at least they can get closer to complying with the code that that sounds great um, all right, so before we pick a date to continue this to, I do see one more hand I call on Doug. <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to say I don't have the deed restriction that was distributed in front of me, but my memory was that 
75% of the site had to be capable of supporting plant growth. And I would not interpret the permeable pavers with a gravel subbase as meeting that uh, condition. So, but I realize that'll be up to others. Thank you. Great. Um, so uh, this is sort of for Mr. Um, Lou and Mr. Campbell and Chris. First, for our applicants, how long do you need to finish out all of whatever new plans or, um, and then Chris, does this have to go to the Conservation Commission? So uh, when would we see this again as a planning board? When should we continue this to? Are you asking me or? Well, I, I guess for, I guess on their end, Michael, how long do you need to, and does, and then to Chris, it's, do they have to go to the Conservation Commission first and then come back to us? And how long do you think that will take? I think if we can have um, some sort of dialogue with Dave Zomek about this, and maybe he can act as the liaison to the commission I'm, I, logistically, I'm not sure how this will work because the Conservation Commission has already reviewed the project and approved it. You know, do we have to go back and, and do another formal um, hearing with them? Or can we find, um, if this is, if, if we're headed in the right direction, you know, can we find out and have further dialogue about how much it's going to take or if we, you know for instance if we have if we can only count 50 percent of this area then i mean i've talked to mr uh, to kevin about you know we, we talked about other areas where there could be in uh, per, permeable paving for instance at the entry drive a portion of that it might be a nice entry and also some type of traffic calming to kind of make people slow down if you will because it's a different it's a it's a, it's going to be a bumpier ride you know, across that type of um, uh, surface than, than it is asphalt. So that could visually look nice as well as serve the function of, of some safety. Um, but if that were the, if for instance, if you're only allowing 50% of it to be counted as um, open and able to support vegetation, then we would have to add this permeable paving um, in other areas. Okay, but so I think we need a couple of days to try to work out an understanding of you know what's acceptable, and then for us to figure out how many. But I can see that we might be able to come back to the next planning board hearing if there's time on that agenda. So, Chris, if um, they sound on on this and very reasonable, and they can get this done quickly, so dialogue needs to happen. When do we think this would come back? Uh, the 17th or the 1st? Um, it could come back on the 17th. I think you have a public hearing on the 17th about a voting requirement. Um, there's one other thing that I think we put on the 17th, but it's not springing to mind right now and I don't have my schedule with me. Um, but if, if the applicant needs to go back to the CONCOM and say, you know, CONCOM, do you think this is a big change? Do you like what, we're, what you're seeing here? You know, then it'll take a little bit longer. So you do have a meeting on um, July 1st. Um, the Amherst Media Project is coming in on July 1st, but we might be able to sneak this in, um, you know, if it's gonna take 15 or 20 minutes to approve it before that. Um, so, and then you have another meeting on July 15th. So I guess those are the choices. July 17th, which seems very soon, if they have to go to the Conservation Commission, maybe you could ask Mr. Zomek when the next Conservation yeah, that's Commission. that's what I was gonna say. Is, do they have to go back to the Conservation Commission? There seems to be um, confusion on that point. David. David's gonna stand up. Yeah, David. Yeah, I'm just looking at the calendar. Um, so we have a meeting on the 10th. I'd like to confer. I have a, I have a, a another scheduled meeting with our town council tomorrow on another matter, and I'd like to just run this by her. I'm not sure the commission needs to weigh in. This might merely be the town of Amherst. Um, so um, I think the 17th is is possible, but um, 
The first might be more realistic. Okay. Um, if, if that's okay with the applicant, I, I think I, what I've heard is very positive, and I, and I think um, working with Kevin and working with um, with Mike, I, I think we can work through this and come back to you with a with a plan that that meets uh, all of the requirements. So I'm optimistic, um, but I just like a little time. I, I I feel a little bit rushed to promise it on the 17th. Okay, so let's go with the first. Let's continue this to July 1st. Um, Chris, time, yeah, we have, is there any way you put could that meet, first? Could you meet at six o'clock on July 1st? Would that be possible? You're asking the planning board members if we can have I'm a meeting the on, the, board, fir yeah. on the first the, uh, at 6 p.m. How about this? Hearing, yeah. Can I see a show of hands of anyone who cannot do six o'clock on July 1st? for an early 30 minute start earlier for planning board. I don't see any hands. So everyone, it appears Jack, can. Jack Jemsick has his hand up. Oh, where? His physical hand. Oh, physical, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, if everyone else can be there. Yeah, um, I think we have enough. And then Jack, I know you have a meeting. Um, when you're done with that, if you could just join us. If we start 30 minutes earlier, does it mean that we'll end 30 minutes earlier? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can make, I can, I possibly can make six, but it's just, uh, I do have another meeting beforehand. But. I, I'm aware of that, yes. So Chris, just, is it because we've already set a time for something? Why are we, um, Shuffling Actually, we haven't gonna... advertised it yet. No, we haven't. That's well, we haven't advertised it yet. So we could go with six thirty. Yes, that would be fine. Or, or six thirty-five on six thirty-five. Six thirty-five on July first. For this on July first, and then we'll make the other meeting. Um, we'll probably put that on seven. Sounds good. One o'clock. And then we can get rid of some other stuff, hopefully, too. All right, so everyone, I think, has their next uh, next steps. And uh, to our applicants, thank you for coming. And um, we need a luck. motion, right? We need motion and a vote. Motion and a yes. vote. So if, there's, if I see a hand, I'll call on someone for a motion, thanking the applicants. We'll move this. Uh, I assume, Mr. Liu, that this is, whoa, good to, um, hmm. Uh, good for July 1st will be all right for you and Mr. Campbell. Yeah, it is okay with me, Kevin. Me too. Great. All right. All right. So we'll see you then at 635 on July 1st. And let me see if there's a, do I have a hand? I still need someone to, oh, I see Doug. Go, Doug. go for it, Doug. No move to continue. To July 1st at 635. I need yep. a second. I see Jack, thank you very much. Um, and at this, I'm just gonna say all in favor, you, you can just you raise your hand. Roll call. Oh, do I again? Okay, here we go. Michael. Sorry to say. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Michael. He's muted. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Oh dear. No, he's Michael. I approve. Okay. Uh, Maria. Approve. Jack. Approve. David? Approve. Doug? Approve. Janet? Janet? Approve. Sorry. And myself. So unanimous off until July 1st. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone yeah. for coming and uh, we look forward to seeing this coming back in a final form. Thanks so much. Thank you for hearing us. Great. All right, so it is, wow, 7.46. So we're almost exactly right on time. Amazing. So at this point, we're doing something historic here. We are going to have our first joint meeting with CRC. And I want to welcome the chair of the CRC. I believe uh, 
Is she here? Mandy Jo, if you want to recognize yourself. I am here. Welcome. Nice to see you. So um, if you could let me know who is here from uh, your CRC committee. So I will call our Community Resources Committee meeting to order at 7.47 p.m. because we have a quorum. Um, it is virtual governor's orders, uh, suspending the provisions of open meeting law. And at this time, I'm going to recognize all of our committee members so that we can test their audio and you can see who our committee members are. So I am Mandy Jo Haneke. I am the chair of the Community Resources Committee. I thank you guys for bringing us in and, and having this joint meeting. Sarah Swartz. We saw her earlier. I'm present. <laughs> um, Steve Schreiber. Present. Hi. Evan Ross. I'm here. And Shalini Balmilne. Hmm. She popped in by Pam. She, she somehow got back into the attendees. Hold on. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, right. I'm putting her back in there. Where'd she go? Okay. She's, she's there, there now. Shani, if you are connected, please say hi. Hi. <laughs> good, good. Welcome. Good, good. Yeah. Thank you for having us. So, do you want me to just start in, Christine? Sure. Um, at this point, um, so we're in a joint hearing, both planning board, CRC, and uh, this is to just discuss zoning bylaws, how to handle it, process. And I want to make note that we have a flow chart um which i don't know do pam could we put that up can um, you see it this flow chart and if we put that up as a visual others can see what we're looking at and then at that point uh, mandy joe please feel free to tell us about it wait a minute can you see it no, not yet no. i see you up yeah. oh, it looks wonderful fab Fab, great job. So this flowchart, uh, to give a little introduction, is sort of is an attempt to sort of set forth how zoning bylaws amendments or revisions or even new bylaws how they might flow through both the planning board and the town council and particularly the community resource committee. Um, we were asked to do something like this by the town council and we were asked to work with the planning board. So we are here to hopefully have a conversation about thoughts on what this looks like um, and, and anything that might need changed or desired to be changed. This is slightly different from, I believe, a prior flowchart that the planning board has seen. The main difference, um, besides some fixes of clerical issues is the first two boxes. I believe the planning board last saw a flowchart that did not have those boxes, but instead had a small box at the very bottom that said, things will happen before the start of this flowchart and we hope to collaborate during those things. Um, and so the attempt here has been to sort of indicate what those things might be and how that might look. Um, this flowchart is meant to be able to work for almost any situation that a zoning amendment might be presented to the council. Um, we recognize that many of them will start with planning staff or planning board, but given what our charter says and our role as counselors and legislators, we also recognize that some of our, our counselors may actually propose a zoning bylaw amendment or a new one on their own directly to the council. Um, or we may actually get a, part, a petition article from residents in town and that would come directly to the council. And so those, when it starts there, they would start in box three, the third blue box. Um, but we're trying to accommodate 
the bulk of what we perceive to be the bulk of zoning bylaw amendments, which would come from staff or planning board, um, and how, how that might look. And so what this attempts to do beyond that is to sort of set forth and include all of the required state law steps and charter steps in this flow chart in hopes so that a visual gives people an idea of what it may look like as things go through the system. And so it requires, you know, both in, the, in this new council manager form of government, both the planning board and the town council are required to hold public hearings. Town state law is allowed to designate the holding of that public hearing to a subcommittee. And it has designated the holding of that public hearing to the community resources committee. At the same time, the council asked that we as community resources committee work as much as possible with the planning board to hold those hearings jointly um, which is why there is that joint box down at the bottom. Um, and then there are timelines as you oh. hold a hearing. There are subsequent timelines for when, after we've held the hearing on the community resources side, how long it can be until the council actually votes on the proposal. So that's all in the bottom half, but I do wanna talk about the top two boxes um, because those are the ones that you haven't seen yet. And this starts with, um, it, the first one is that the council would hear a presentation on potential bylaw revisions from the planning staff. This came as um, a recommendation from staff, but also um, as a result of hearing that from staff that the planning board um, was looking for some sort of um, guidance from the council as to what potential zoning amendments they may want to see, that the council may want to see. And so in talking through this or options, this was an option that, that came up and that I've presented here in this, this flow chart of if the planning board is looking for guidance, the best way to get that guidance is to get it directly from the council by maybe having a presentation as to what might the planning staff be looking at, um, what um, when councils councilors were elected, what their, their platforms might have been, what they wanted to focus on, and things like that. And then, but, but that presentation wouldn't have specifics. So, you know, to, to give examples, if we're looking at um, you know something about say downtown zoning, it wouldn't have specifics on what you know. One thing that's been mentioned in council a lot is setbacks on sidewalks or like size of sidewalks and stuff. It wouldn't have specific proposals. It would be, do you want us to be working on that type of thing, or do you want us to be working on inclusionary zoning, or the sign bylaw, or form-based zoning, or the rezoning of, of various parts of town um, or, or fixing zoning in somewhere else. It would be that general high level conversation that then the council could say, here's the five or six things or three or four things that we'd like most to see come back to us first. Um, so that's where the second box is on prioritization of referrals to work on the specific drafts. So that's, that's when council might say, this is what we'd like to work on, that, what, what we'd like to see. And then it would go back to staff, back to planning board. Uh, CRC might see a couple of drafts in the middle of that. Um, this is where it's not really fully set. And then when it's when it's a better draft, when it's ready to sort of go prime time, as some people would say, then it would come back for that formal referral to hold those hearings um, and start that sort of formal process timeline that state law sets forth on all those requirements for hearings and timelines and getting recommendations and all of that. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Um, we're really looking for comments. You know, we're, we're hoping to be able to present this to the council in approximately two weeks um, as something that planning board, hope, hopefully if it's well received, that planning board and CRC is, is sort of sort of of. Um. I will open it up to questions from the board. I also want to ask Chris Bestrup if she has any comments on this. Um, she plays an integral part of this as the planning department uh, director. And how does this impact her resources and um, 
obviously it affects a lot of what they're working on. Chris, are you there? Yes, I'm here. So um, I think, you know, there's enough flexibility in the first two boxes to um, be able to work with that well. Um, I guess the one comment I would make is the first line, town council here's presentation on potential bylaw revisions from planning staff. And I'm thinking, you know, bylaw revisions may come from council members or other sources. So is this, are the first two boxes only related to things that the planning department or, or the planning board is uh, seeing as initiatives and then anything that is other than that would come in in the third box? Is that? Like Mandy Jo, an example is this article 14, the temporary bylaw. Who did that, like, what do we credit? How did that come into these boxes and who did it come from or start it? I guess it came from town staff. It came from yeah. me, Rob Mora and myself. You know, the idea was Rob's and then Rob and I drafted it. Um, so. So maybe we should add on from just planning staff that it could be other staff? director or, level um, staff. Uh, how about staff of the conservation and development department or? Oh, that's bigger, right. Does that make sense, Mandy? Yeah. That's a good point, Chris. Any other issues you see at this time, Chris, with this? Nope. Okay. So at this time, I'll um, open it up to planning board members if they have questions to ask um, the CRC or specifically Mandy Joe. Uh, Doug, I recognize you. Open it up to the CRC committee too. Uh, come again? At, but my committee too, if they have questions. We oh, haven't. Great. Okay, we so I'm watching all hands, so I'll also <laughs> watch for CRC and I'll take you um, in order as I see you. So right now I see Doug and then Janet and then Michael Burtwistle. So, Doug? Yeah, I was just going to say that at least based on the way Mandy introduced the, the diagram, I thought that the submissions of zoning changes that came in by submission or by petition or via a town councilor would arrive at box three. And so, uh, you know, boxes one and two are in fact only planning board related. Uh, and I thought it would clarify the diagram if there were uh, an arrow coming in from the side next to box three that said something like, you know, submissions via petition or town councilors, and and then and then an arrow to to box three. Thank you. Does that make sense, Mandy Joe? Yes, and that's a fantastic idea. Great, thank you. All right, I recognize it will be Janet, and then I see Michael, and I see Shell and I. So Janet, are you there? I'm there, thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm glad to see this meeting taking place. I know the CRC has been discussing this for a long time. I have some questions for um, uh, the planning board members about past practice, um, and, and also Steve Schreiber. Um, on past practice on the timing of the public hearings. Basically, the question is, I have two questions and let me ask the first one, please. Um, when in the revision process did the planning board hold public hearings? Did the planning board hold a public hearing just before they sent a zoning bylaw revision to the select board in town meeting? Or did they send, did they have a public hearing earlier in that process? And then I have a second question. Um, Chris, do you want to answer that, how it worked with town meeting? Sure. Um, it, it really, uh, I think town meeting um, was less constrained with regard to um, timing of when public hearings were held. The planning board would usually hold pu public hearings whenever they were able to. Um, and the formal um, method of having a, a zoning amendment arrive at the select board and then have the select board refer it to the planning board didn't usually happen unless it was a petition article or something that was being proposed by someone other than the planning board. 
So it was usually the planning board decided that they wanted to work on something. They worked on it. They scheduled a public hearing. They made a recommendation um, to town meeting and it was, you know, within, well, if the town meeting happened in November, the planning board wouldn't really hold public hearings until September. So it was probably, you know, as much as two months before um, town meeting met that the planning board would hold a public hearing. And then my, my second question is, what was the purpose of the public hearing? Was it listening sessions to get ideas from the public, their reactions, then revise, make revisions based on what they were hearing? Or was it just, you know, checking the box, we need to hold the public hearing, mm -hmm. like presenting the, the revision, listening to comments, and then saying, okay, we've held our public hearing. Was it more of an interactive pro process with the public? Yeah, yeah go right. ahead, Chris. Yeah, it was an interactive process. We often had um, members of the public, uh, we always had members of the public at our public hearings. And um, in fact, the zoning amendment could be amended until it uh, arrived um, on the warrant. And you know, zoning amendments were constantly amended. They, they would be presented to the public at a public hearing. The planning board would hear what the public had to say. Staff would go back and tweak it but then all, all the way along the line, the planning board would meet again the next week and say, oh, we wanna change this or that. So it was really a more fluid, you know, flexible method. Um, and sometimes even things changed, you know, the night before they got to town meeting or the night of town meeting. So they were, they were constantly, um, you know, looking at things and, and changing them. I, that's, my, that's my experience. Okay. I also just want to add one of the things I like about this flow chart is it gets the key players involved earlier. So there's not surprises as much and the people who are actually voting on this in the end are seeing it as it develops. Um, a lot of what Chris is talking about was is it got close to town meeting um, and it, it, it was changing up until the very end, which isn't always the best um, way to do it as a moving target. And this, I think, flows a little bit better to get people's input all along. Um, Janet, do you have more questions? Not, not now, thank you. Okay, great. Um, Christine, I saw Steve Schreiber trying to wave his uh, physical hand. Oh, physical hand. I'm like, I don't yes. see it. You guys don't do physical hands? <laughs> Steve, <laughs> would you like to add a comment to that? Do you have some historical um, no, but, uh, perspective? It brings back great memories, but um, so the zoning yes. articles were the only articles I went to town meeting that I believe were statutorily required to have a public hearing, you know, by, you know, by that name, which is a, you know, kind of the highest level of public comment. So I, uh, the fact that it could be changed after the fact, in fact, on the floor of the town meeting, to me always was a kind of a conceptual problem that, you know, that you've had this public hearing but then it can be changed quite a bit, uh, you know, along the way. But there doesn't need to be another public hearing. There never needed to be, there only needs to be one public hearing as I understand it. So it never was completely clear at what point does it become a different animal, you know, that it's changed so much that it needs to be stopped and republic hearing. Thank you. Um, I'll go to um, Shalini. And then I see Michael next. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add a respond also to Janet's question about involvement. One thing we learned from, I learned from Jim Nash from Northampton when he came down is that we can get the public involved early on in the process, not necessarily in the public hearing itself, but you know, through the district meetings and through emails to neighborhood associations. And so there are ways we can collect information and keep people informed and get their perspective throughout the process. Um, the other question that I had for the planning board was uh, given your level of work and quantity of work, how involved would you all like to be in this process and where and, you know, like, 
I mean, many of us agree that we don't want to feel like we're stepping on anyone's toes and taking away someone else's job or whatever. But it's more like, how do we make this process really effective um, and make the changes that are needed in alignment with a master plan, do what's needed for our town, but do it in a way that it's seamless, it involves everyone, it's transparent, and it doesn't burden anybody. And more specifically, like, do you want to be involved in some of like, I feel like there's a lot of going back and forth where you all look at things. And so I, you know, like you all provide the technical uh, feedback, which I think is definitely required. But then there's a lot of continuing to go back and forth between the CRC and the planning board. And so how much of that is something you all want to be part of? And if there's anything else you want to be part of in addition to what's there in the flow chart. Thank you. Um, the next hand I see up is Michael. Michael Burt was. Thank you. Um, one of the primary arguments for the elimination of town meeting and the adoption of the present charter was the, the, was the desire for a more efficient means of changing the zoning bylaw. That was one of the main selling points of those who were trying to get rid of town meeting and to, to create a new charter. Uh, in town meeting days, zoning bylaw change was a fairly simple process in my experience. First step was based on suggestions from the public, the planning department staff, members of the planning board, its zoning subcommittee, uh, a, the zoning subcommittee discussed an issue at some length. The source of that issue was varied. The uh, chapter 40A of section five of, of the Massachusetts general law suggests nine possible ways in which a zoning bylaw change can be brought to the uh, legislative body. Uh, any one of those uh, results in it coming to the planning board uh, in terms of the, uh, the uh, the first paragraph of um, section five says, the board of selectmen or the city council shall within 14 days of receipt of such zoning ordinance, submit it to the planning board for review. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, the planning board then is step two, uh, after a public hearing and discussion, voted to recommend it after several changes or suggestions or a variety of ways of working out the, um, the suggested uh, amendment. And then part three, after debate in town meeting, with or without the endorsement of the select board or with or without the endorsement of the finance committee, the zoning by the proposed zoning bylaw was passed, rejected, or returned to the planning board for additional work. Uh, that was seemed to me to be pretty simple and straightforward. And, and in my five years in town meeting, some proposed changes passed, some did not, uh, which is as it should be, I think. Uh, However, this May 6, 2020 flowchart, in that we are presented with, it seems to me, an extremely complex process involving multiple referrals, time consuming back and forth negotiating among the council, two of its committees, town staff, the planning board, and its zoning subcommittee, and perhaps even the zoning board of appeals. This certainly does not serve the goal of greater efficiency. It does, however, significantly reduce the responsibility and authority of the planning board. Please note that the chart states that the planning board's role, and this is in, let me find the right place. Um, um, in, in box two, the second box, it sa states that, um, the planning board's role is to quote, work with the planning staff to decide on technical wording of revisions, end quote. While the CRC is empowered to quote, put forth the vision of how the zoning bylaw should work in town, unquote. I respectfully suggest that vision is more properly belonging to the master plan, which of course is the responsibility of the planning board. Now, instead of the cumbersome process proposed by this flowchart, I respectfully suggest that the planning board be allowed to do its work, arguably its most important work, the creation of suggestions for zoning bylaw revisions. That has 
previously been and should continue to be the planning board's main responsibility, proposing revisions to the legislative body. It worked formerly with the town meeting. There's no reason it can't work now with the town council. When the council receives a planning board recommendation for a change in the zoning bylaw, it is of course free to accept, reject, amend, or refer it as the council chooses. If it wishes to elongate the process by delegating consideration to a committee or committees, that of course is also its privilege. Uh, but that is not the purview of the planning board. The planning board's purview is to present the suggested bylaw changes as, as far as this particular issue is concerned. Uh, and I must say that it is an added benefit that if and when we take the model that previously served us well and use it in the context of the new charter, two separate hearings will necessarily be required for the passage of zoning bylaw changes. Hopefully the two separate hearings will lead to an increased level of public participation and scrutiny, which I think is a significant benefit when it comes to changes of this magnitude. Thank you. Um, Janet, do you have your hand up? Or no? Um, Maria. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so those are all really great points, Michael. And I, I do understand how this seems a lot more complicated, but when we transition to town council from town meeting, the zoning subcommittee and the planning board are working on a series of amendments and also this priority chart. I know we've shown many, many times where we were hoping to get um, guidance from town council because they were the newly elected, you know, officials to sort of help us prioritize where to put our energies. And so I think what this flow chart is doing is not saying necessarily like, the planning board no longer is involved or, or even able to bring, you know, zoning amendments. I think what it's saying is just trying to set up a process so that we can move forward in a way that works with state law and the way our town charter is now written. And so um, I appreciate all the work that's gone behind it. It's a very complicated thing, all these arrows and everything, but I, I think that we are moving toward that original goal when we transition where i don't know if you remember we had like three zoning amendments that were just ready we're like let's test the, this process with those three zoning amendments and then also we had that big matrix of all these priorities and we basically waited for town council to tell us you know how do you want to move forward and i think this is their you know this is them trying to do just that you know as, as clear and simplified way as possible while meeting all these many, many requirements. And so I I wouldn't, I mean, yeah, it seems like there's a lot of steps, but I think a lot of them are actually just mandated. I think that like what Mandy Jo was saying, the first two boxes are the new ones, but the rest is, you know, it, it's, um, it's, it's kind of just cleaning it up and, and saying who drops what in at what point. I, it, it is still a lot, but I, I just feel like we are moving in the right direction because it's, we've, we just got to do it. I mean, especially with this um, zoning amendment coming up with the um, outdoor, with the restaurants and whatnot. So I, I think we should just give it a go, um, see how it goes for um, this first few amendments. Um, I would hate to have to keep rehashing this over and over. I, I think we should just dive in. We've been waiting for, I forget how long, um, to get something, you know, uh, done and uh, I felt like as a ZSC member we were just treading water for a long time and I don't know how the rest of the planning board members feel but um, I think that yeah I, I, I hear what you're saying about this seeing very convoluted but considering what we're waiting through um, it's, it's a really good first step so thank you Maria I call on Jack yes um, I, I, I appreciate you know Mike's uh, viewpoint on this. It's it's really interesting. You know, going back to town meeting and how things were done, and you know how it all you know is changing now with the town council. But I I did appreciate uh, Shalini's points about wow. They, you know, it seems like there's opportunity for much more grassroots uh, involvement. You know, uh, 
that is steered by people that were elected to their positions where, you know, planning board, we are appointed. I, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, we're good at, at um, you know, say auditing uh, decisions uh, or, or proposals, excuse me, proposals made um, by others and, 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 and proposals generated by us as well. But I just feel like, I think we have a more valuable role in terms of more in an auditing thing versus a directive because I mean, I certainly uh, did not campaign to join planning board <laughs> with any particular viewpoint other than I just, you know, want the town to be, uh, you know, maintain its, you know, its good standing and, and, and grow and, and, and provide the best to, you know, our the citizens in Amherst. So um, I'm, I'm very intrigued by town council taking on and shaping uh, way uh, things in a way that, you know, planning board really would just be stabbing in the dark, you know, in the past. Um, and, and again, I think we're looking at also at, at expediting uh, changes that again are mandated by the representatives who are our town council. So, uh, but, it's so interesting going back to town meeting how it was done and you know it was, it was that way for a very long time and it worked to a certain level but we want it with this charter change to work in a different way i guess at this point thank you jack i'll next call on janet so um i'm i've been on the zoning subcommittee for i guess almost a year now and um we have spent a lot of time on the zoning subcommittee trying to figure out how to bring these three amendments. And then there's, you know, we've been talking about inclusionary zoning and a lot of other issues. And I, you know, the, the chart that Maria has put together or the zoning subcommittee put together with the planning staff is there's a lot of things on there and there's a lot of expertise in the planning staff and the planning board. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I do see the planning board as sort of working with the planning department as a repository of sort of expertise on how the zoning bylaw works or doesn't work. Um, we were told in the fall not to bring zoning to the town council because the town council is not ready. And so I see this effort as a way of sort of the town council getting ready. Um, I also find it kind of confusing and I, I as usual, have a, a question. Another question, which is um, when, if we get to box three, it says, the town council receives proposed zoning bylaw amendment, say from the planning board. And so would the planning board bring a proposed amendment, which I assume would be, you know, workshopped in the zoning subcommittee and working with the planning staff. They have an amendment they think needs to be done. They have the language down. Would we come to the town council with a proposed amendment without a public hearing? Or would we be waiting to have a public hearing to have it referred back to us and then hold it or work on it. I just, I found that piece super confusing. What, like what, like, I don't know. So maybe Chris um, Bestrup or Mandy Jo can add to this, but it's my understanding that, you know, by the time we have something that's coming that we're sending to town council, we've had numerous meetings on it and all of the planning board meetings are open and it's on our agenda and it's it's not like a permit hearing process. It's just on our agenda and the public can comment any meeting on it and we would discuss it. From my history of working on planning board, it, it would be numerous mm -hmm. hearings that it would come to us and we would keep reworking it and sending it back and Chris and her staff would work on it and we'd fine tune it and would hear the public and that would fine tune it. So there's what's not in this is our process because CRC is trying to not tell us how to do our job. We would still be doing our job in this. It's just sort of then where does it go? And you and there's like Mandy Joe was trying to explain, there's a lot of deadlines and listings and notifications that have to happen. And that's more what this shows. So just those orange or red boxes on the left-hand side, it's not meant to simplify us or nelegate us and or shrink our work. All of that still exists. 
It's just how are we communicating with CRC and how are all the players involved to actually then go and send it and have the powers that be town council approve it. Well, I guess, um, I guess my question is, so we, so when, when the planning board notice, like when we hold the public hearing under the statute, it, there's all these requirements and it's, it's a significant thing. And so I agree with you that we should be involving public early on. Um, but notification goes out. I'd love to hit all the networks that the town council has and have a hearing. But also when we, when we notice that hearing, it has a legal effect of at that point, um, the zoning change that the planning board has proposed is have, holding a public hearing on will apply to any permit that comes in that's pending at the moment. And so that that's kind of an important, you know, inflection point. And so I would think, you know, but if, if, if the proposal is the planning board has done the workshopping, we've spent a lot of time on it, we're ready to go. We're holding back on the public hearing to send it back to the town council, to send it back to us, to work with the CRC to schedule. And they have, they go and they review the whole process and then we have a joint hearing, a public, a public hearing that could just push things back for like months and months, you know, and, you know, because I think CRC also has a very big agenda. And so I wonder, like, what's, is that a good idea? Like, you I, know, Michael's sort of I, suggesting a more separate path. We do our job. We love the town council. We want them to pass our zoning. We work with the CRC. They, everybody knows what we're doing but we re retain some autonomy and a little bit more nimbleness in terms of just getting things moving. And so, and in a process, you know, so that, that's my thought right now, thanks. Yeah, I just wasn't clear on your, where it would get held up for months and months. If you can just give an example, um, and then maybe someone can address that later, but I, I wasn't sure where in this process it gets held up for months and months. I, I you know, you know, we all have problems with our schedule as a group. And I, you know, I've gone to a lot of CRC meetings and they have a very big purview. And, you know, they do, they have been kind of ruminating and working on this for almost 11 months. And so, you know, things are slow. They also have trouble having a meeting date because they just, because of their schedules. And so I just wonder like, will this help the planning board's process? Will this really help the process of moving zoning ahead when we see priorities we want to put them in the um, hopper get the town council activated get the CRC activated you know do we all have to work together as 19 people or how many we are as a group um, am I counting wrong 20 people they, you're talking about planning board and CRC yeah so you know that's, so that so would be 12 people yeah, yeah. But we also have to activate the town council who has to refer it back to us and then we're still waiting to trigger the public hearing date i, I like i i kind of it seems it just seems harder or something or more complicated okay i think i hear are, you are a you little having a private conversation or can no you... so i think i hear your michael please oh, unnecessary my... stop no, you guys are just so back i asked janet and i have hands up and i've had a hand up for yeah. 10 minutes Michael, if you remember, she asked a question. I was unclear how to handle it, so she just clarified. So at this time, I was going to turn to Mandy Jo, who has her hand up as chair of the CRC. I was gonna ask her, there is a point here. CRC is very busy. We see your agendas. You've got a lot going on. Where does this kind of bylaw flow chart fall in your priorities? Um, you know, you've got a lot going on. How would this fit in? How would we ensure that things wouldn't take weeks? I don't think months, but weeks to um, get into this flow chart. Mandy? Thank you. Um, I just want to respond. The CRC meets every other week, um, every two weeks, essentially, twice a month at a minimum. Um, with the three planning board meetings coming up in the next two weeks, we will be meeting five times. Um, and so one of the things the council just did, uh, Janet is right that a couple months ago, as of you know last year, CRC had a huge, huge purview. Um, it had public ways, it had um, town services, it had 
pub, you know, it, it had zoning and planning and economic development and public ways and higher education and a whole lot of stuff. And back in January, the town council split the, those responsibilities among two committees. So right now, the community resources committee's main responsibilities are planning, zoning, development, and economic development. Um, and therefore, our, our, I, I would say as chair, the priorities are master plan and zoning and economic development um, as they are. And, and as many people know, zoning directly relates to economic development. Um, and I, you know, so, so I think we can look at the two zoning amendments that were actually on the table right now, the temporary zoning bylaw that was proposed by staff to get an idea of how quickly, if necessary, both CRC and the planning board can move. Um, we at CRC, it was, it came to staff, it came to town council. It was on an agenda for a referral, and frankly, referrals really can occur immediately. Um, they they just show up on an agenda, and they don't take a lot of time, and they immediately go back out. And it is being held. A hearing is being held next week, as everyone knows. We'll be back here in a joint meeting to hold that hearing approximately three and a half weeks after it was brought to council because we could not get the hearing any earlier. Um, and then it will be back at, it is planned to be back at council on June 15th. So I wanted to point out a couple of things. If we hold joint hearings, the planning board has that 65 days to get to the hearing. Um, you will see on the green side of this chart that the CRC and the council, I think it's, it's not the green side, sorry. It is the last blue box. The council has 90 days from the date of the CRC hearing to vote. So holding a joint hearing actually almost guarantees quick turnaround of zoning bylaw proposals because once CRC has held a hearing, it has to get to a vote, not the first reading, the second reading within 90 days. So that, that automatically puts a limited time on that. Um, and then I wanted to address one more thing about the, the whole process Janet was talking about. Um, the whole refers back to planning board and yes, it would come to council without that initial hearing, but that's mainly to start that clock and to allow the, the council, the community resources committee and the planning board to start really working together to plan that hearing. Um, hopefully the, the CRC will have already uh, seen the amendments that the planning board has been working on and, and put in some public comments and comments to the planning board about its thoughts and all um, as we get through this process. But at some point, um, the council technically has to let the planning board, let the, let the not the planning board, let the community resources committee formally take um, a recommendation and a hearing stance. Um, we are, our charge as a subcommittee is written such that we can't just do that really without the council saying, go ahead and do it. And so that third box is really sort of a, a check box that's very administerial to get that formal authorization from the council to really just start the process. It could start in the beginning, but if it starts in the beginning before the planning board has really been through its you know, work on, on timing, then you're limited to 65 days, which is a very quick turnaround for you. And so this is a way to say, well, we can take our time, the planning board can take the time it needs there. And then when it says, when it's ready for that hearing, um, it can bring it in and say, let's get this hearing going. Let's start really communicating with CRC to plan that hearing and get it going. I hope that answers the questions. Okay, that's very helpful, thank you. I'm gonna move to Doug Marshall now. Thank you. Um, in, in Michael's comments, he mentioned that one of the purposes of converting to the town council was to make things more uh, efficient in the way they operated. Um, I would argue that there was a second objective, which was to have a more accountable legislative body. The fact that we now have a more accountable legislative body is 
reflected in this flow chart because as accountable representatives, they want to be involved in what these proposals are uh, so, so that they can keep their seats, so that they can be accountable to their districts, and so that we don't waste time on something that they're never going to approve because it's contrary to the interests of their constituents. So I view this flow chart as uh, a necessary partnership between the planning board and town council because we need town council's support for whatever we put forward or we're wasting our time. And they want us to be working on things that are consistent with their uh, platforms and with the way they understand the interests of their constituents. So I uh, uh, support Maria's position that we should give this a try the way it's written. If it doesn't work, we can adjust it. Um, and then finally, I would say that although not every one of the planning board members have, has commented thus far, uh, I think Shalini is probably getting a good answer to her question about how involved the planning board wants to be. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I'm gonna call on Evan Ross. Yeah, so actually Doug said a lot of the things that I was going to say and, and so did Mandy Jo, um, but I'll just speak very generally for a second to say that um, some of our conversation has been about what things were like in town meeting, um, but of course we're in a very a dramatically different form of government. And I think that allows us to think a little bit more creatively, um, one, about what the relationship between the planning board and the legislative body is. And, and that's what I like about this is it starts to articulate a clear relationship um, between these two bodies that both have some jurisdiction over zoning. Um, the other thing I think it allows us to do is uh, it gives us a little bit of freedom to reimagine the role and the work of the planning board. And so, um, you know, I think that Shalini's question was born out of a concern that I also have, which is um, I've attended a few of y'all's meetings and uh, y'all work real hard and those meetings are really long. And I think there's a thought behind it of, um, not trying to take things away from the planning board, but essentially trying to make things easier for the planning board to do the necessary work. And I think Doug's point about making sure you have buy-in from the legislative body that inevitably has to approve this, um, and also bringing in um, some of the priorities and objectives of the, the representatives of the council early um, actually makes the work better and more efficient. And it also allows you to some extent to shift some of that work to another body that has people who are eager to work on these things. And I don't think that compromises the autonomy of the planning board at all. Um, I think that actually helps create a, a better dynamic. And, and to what Doug said about accountability, I think that's important too, that you have collaboration between an appointed body and elected body. And I think that creates a better product in the end because you have people who are accountable um, to the people and then people who are there um, largely for the expertise they bring working together. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm in love with this process and perhaps there are things that I would change, but I do like that it articulates a, a clear relationship between the two bodies and how they can work together. Um, and I think it's worth trying out. Um, because what I think it's going to show us is where there are opportunities to reimagine the relationship and reimagine how the planning board might operate so that it can be a, a more manageable body as well. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of good things in this that are worth trying. Um, and the one other thing I'll say is, is I agree uh, wholeheartedly with a statement that Janet made earlier. Um, which is that our planning department and planning staff just have so much expertise and knowledge. Um, and one of the things that isn't as clearly articulated here, but I would like to see is, is really more involvement of that planning department. Um, because I think that um, the planning board and the town council should not be doing all of the work writing zoning proposals um, or, or, or any of that. We're, I think I see us 
to some extent as review bodies. Um, and so I'd actually like to see both the council and the planning board generate fewer zoning amendments and see the planning staff generate more zoning amendments based on their history, their institutional knowledge, their expertise, um, and then have the council and the planning board function more as review bodies and also trying to align them with our visions for the town and our, which are driven, of course, by the master plan. As someone who's been on the board for five years, I, you really see us. I agree with so much of that, Evan. Um, at this point, I, I'm gonna call on Chris and I just want the board members to um, think about, I, I so agree that this, this is a lot of thought at, has gone into this, a lot of effort, um, but I would be willing to try this and it's not written in stone. It could be adjusted. And I think we'll learn a lot as we roll forward and actually try to get some of these bylaws going. So if the members um, can think about specific things that they wanna change, like Doug had a comment about that third box, like things like that, what could we tweak or needs to be tweaked right now, but that overall it could be uh, let's, let's try it kind of um, thing. Chris, I see your hand. Let me mute myself. Right. So I wanted to say exactly the same thing that Christine Gray Mullen just said. I think we should try this. It's not cast in stone. It's not like, um, you know, chapter 40A of Mass General Laws. It's a guide, a guidebook. The things, you know, below the middle of the page where there are, you know, specific numbers of days that have to occur between this and that and how many readings various groups have to have, those are cast in stone. But the whole top of the page really is just kind of a guidance for us. And if it doesn't work, we can change it. Um, and everything that the planning board does uh, as a body is completely outside of this picture. The planning board can go along and do what it does now, working with staff to um, create zoning amendments and then uh, present them like it says in the first box. So I think this is a good outline of how we should, can, and should proceed from now on. And then um, when we find that it is troublesome for whatever reason, we'll make suggestions for um, changing it. And I think it's really good to have guidance from the town council because I can re remember so many times in the past where the planning board was very passionate about something and the planning staff was very passionate but the town meeting wasn't passionate at all about the same thing. And the town meeting would say, no, we really don't want to do that or we don't want to do it that way. And that was you know, somewhat disheartening for both the planning board and staff. So um, in this um, guidance that Mandy Joe is providing us, I think there's a lot more opportunity to know what, what town council might choose to go along with, or perhaps there's something that's proposed that they don't exactly like the full package, but they like aspects of it. So that back and forth, I think, is going to be really helpful. And we're not going to get into a situation where we work for months on something and then have it voted down. So I think this is a good, a good start. And let's try it and see how it works. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, at this time, I only see one member's um, hand up. And I will call on her. And then um, I want the members, I see and then, all right, I see Janet, then Doug, and I want the members to think about um, if you would be up for taking a vote on this um, in support, just recommending, yes, we're willing to try this, let's move forward. Um, Janet? So I, um, I would like to have the planning board talk about this more. It's, it's, I'm sort of struggling to understand why it would be more efficient to hold a joint hearing when the planning board can get a referral or initiate its own zoning change or get something from the member of the public and work on it through the zoning subcommittee, hold the public hearing and then pass it to the town council and then you know, work with the CRC in just a sort of more organic way um, than waiting back and holding back to schedule a joint hearing. So like, I don't, I think that, I don't see why it's, faster, more efficient overall. Um, I do think that there's this amazing opportunity to work with the CRC and town councilors for the planning board to and, and the 
planning staff to work more closely and earlier with the legislation legislative body i don't think we need this chart to do that i think it just makes it makes political sense and it's common sense i've spent years asking that town meeting be more informed on the zoning things as they get along and not just waiting to that you know final warrant review and uh, you know asking um the planning board and the planning department to involve the community more and so i do think we have a new form of government we have town councilors that have you know more um they have their kind of their contacts in the community i think we should tap that now for when we have hearings on important issues um, that are you know permit hearings or any kind of issue the master plan it's great to tap that we had the planning department and planning board could have done that in the past because there's lots of ways to reach people there are lots of community organizations but i still i'm still I'm, i still just in terms of flow and efficiency i i don't see why this is more efficient for us I sort of don't get it. And so I'd like to reflect on that more. It's been great to have this discussion because I sort of get the chart more, which is never, you know, it's always been a struggle for me. But I think that um, if, if the planning board can hold the public hearing, start the clock, pass it up, um, and then, you know, the town council has its own clock. And then, of course, the planning board would want to work with the CRC as they do that. Of course, they, because it's their proposal, you know, or anything. So I, I think these committees will naturally work together. And should because that's you know that's good practice. So I'm I'm sort of on the fence here. Um, so Mandy Joe, this one part I heard twice in there, um, planning board working on it, getting it ready, and then sending it up to town council. I think I don't think we can do that. Don't we have to have a joint hearing? So the hearing does not legally have to be joint. Um, the town council voted to ask voted to recommend that as much as feasibly possible the hearings be joint that vote was a recommendation it was a, also a recognition that there are some times where the hearing may not be logical to be joint um, but that in most cases it can probably be a joint hearing um, so so that's why this proposal has it only considered a joint hearing. Uh, I, I don't think anyone, I, you know, my committee can correct me, but we've had discussions where there are going to be some instances where we might say very early on, you know, we're going to need two hearings on that. Why don't you go ahead and do your own hearing at some point? Because hopefully we will be in that constant contact about these items and be able to determine that earlier rather than later. Um, but both hearings still have, so if planning boards did have, have something and the whole send it up, it goes up, but then it would be sent right down to CRC to have their second to on their own hearing. Yeah. Okay. So there's no direct us to town council. It still has to come back down to you all and do your thing. And okay, that's what I was clarifying. All right, thank you. Um, I'm, I next see Michael and then I see David. Michael? Uh, Thank you. Uh, I want to comment on something that Maria said about an hour ago. Um, I, I can barely hear you, Michael, either. Uh, okay, good. Better? Yeah. I want to comment on something I think uh, that uh, Maria said about an hour ago uh, relative to the way the zoning subcommittee has been uh, essentially holding two or three zoning uh, amendment proposals because uh, they didn't the zoning subcommittee didn't know whether the town council wanted them or I can't paraphrase her exactly. But the fact that there were in several uh, amendments ready to go to the next step, uh, which would have been, of course, a public hearing uh, at the planning board level and then passing it on to the town to, to the council. Uh, that seemed to me a reasonable process. Um, and then something that had already been said by someone else, I can't remember who, a minute ago, the notion that uh, the, the CRC is um, uh, desirous of leading the way in which uh, the planning board uh, understands issues and, and takes up issues, that there are certain issues that the council and the CRC want the planning board to take up. Uh, 
and great. Uh, I think they, if there are issues like that, they should tell us what they are and we should take them up. And I think we would be very happy to take them up if we got a communication from the CRC or the council or any individual member thereof, uh, that this is something that I, I or we are interested in and the planning board will take it up. I think that would be great. I think a good example of, of how the process can really work effectively is the proposed zoning bylaw amendment of, that we're going to talk about, uh, about the, uh, uh, the, the change of temporary needs for, for uh, outdoor dining. Uh, that just, that came as, a, as an emergency measure, essentially, to us. Uh, and it's going to be received and uh, um, adjudicated on an emergency basis, and it will happen really fast. This, that's one place where a joint meeting of the council and the CRC, uh, sorry, of the planning board and the CRC is a really good idea. But as a regular process, I don't think it's necessarily a good idea. Uh, each zoning bylaw idea has its own basic uh, good sense process. Uh, and to try to codify this, I appreciate the work that uh, the CRC has done in putting this together. Uh, but I just think it, it puts us in a, in a situation of having to check off boxes and making sure everything works right when we don't really have to do that. The logic of the, the state laws that requires this, the, the, the town charter that requires certain things, uh, and we can, as long as we follow those regulations, uh, I think whatever way in which the bylaw, the zoning bylaw change comes to the council is fine. And I don't think we need to spend all the time talking about process. I think we need to spend the time talking about specific zoning bylaw changes. And I want the, the zoning, our zoning subcommittee, I've been saying this for a year, I want our zoning subcommittee to process these change of these ideas that they have and get them to the council. And I want the CRC or the council to tell us what they want us to work on. And I don't think we need this chart to do any of those things. Thank you, Michael. Um, David? Uh, hi, thank you. Um, I appreciate the robust conversation that's been going on. Um, and I agree with a lot of it, even though it seems like divergent. It, it seems to me that we are, I'm gonna echo what Michael just said lastly. I think we're, we're in like high mode of process processing and let's just get out of them. Let's just start, stop spinning the wheels here. Let's give this, let's give this a ride, see where it's bumpy, see where it can get fixed, see where it leads us. It'd be great if we got some, if the planning board and the staff received more specific concrete direction on things to work on for development and for zoning changes and for economic development for this town. But let's just start doing the work. And this seems like, a, let's start with this framework. Great. Um, it's important. I think that it's really valuable um, to have the time frames so clearly worked out because that's where things could become fatal. Um, that would be just unnecessary. unnecessary. Um, and, and so having the, these, these time frames worked out, I think is a valuable resource, whether they're joint or not joint hearings. Again, we'll figure that out as we go along. Let's start doing the work. I would be comfortable tonight voting on recommending this as a, you know, as a step forward and understanding that it's a, you know, all step, well, it's always under reconsideration for reevaluation of how well the process works. Let's just, I'd say we should, uh, I would be comfortable voting and recommending that this process start now. Um, and I look forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, at this point, I've heard from a majority of the planning board members who seem to be in support of, uh, let's give this a go and see how it works. Um, I'm gonna call on Sarah Schwartz. I see her hand and then um, we could do a vote. Sarah? Yeah, so I just wanted to say that um, one of the things that town council found out pretty quickly is that we really, we had no rules of procedure and, and a lot of things. And when you come from a place of this is how it was always done, you really rely on those rules and you can bend them as you need to bend them. But we had no established rules and it made things 
very difficult to go forward. And so I think for us, it's just establishing, trying to establish rules that will help everybody as we go along. I hear the, the planning board is, what, what I'm sort of hearing inferred is that the planning board, you guys know what you're doing, right? You're there for a reason. I can totally understand the planning board is saying, please let us do our job and please respect the expertise that we have. And also I myself don't feel like the planning board is, this is another thing that I, I feel like maybe I heard it wrong, but there's maybe a fear that planning board will then become a tool of town council for individual town councilors to get, you know, zoning change that will help us get reelected. And, and I don't, I, that's not true. And I don't see that at all. And I have tremendous respect for the planning board. I think that the things that we've put forward here are just better ways for us to work with you as a team with the utmost respect that we have for you. And so for us, it's just starting to try to figure out the rules and then figure out how we work as a team and then going from there if something doesn't work. And, and it's from where I'm coming from, this is just meant to try to establish a good working relationship when we just don't have any rules yet and how to do it. Thank you, Sarah. So at this time, um, is there someone who just, I, it's a motion of um, how to vote on this? I, I see Doug's hand. Yeah, I'll make a motion that the planning board uh, vote uh, to express its support for this protocol for navigating zoning bylaw amendments. Uh, as a recommendation to town council that we adopt the protocol and uh, see how it goes. <laughs> Is someone willing to second that? Uh, David, I do see your hand up. Are you seconding? Yeah, I, I've got a question. Actually, I've got a procedural question. If this is a joint meeting of the two bodies, is it a joint vote or, or no. is it like a planning board We're vote? So do we sequester the planning board? Uh, I don't understand how it works. No, so even if this was a joint meeting for the bylaw, which we'll run through next week, we would still take our separate votes. So the chair of CRC, if this was a bylaw right now, they would then do their separate vote. But we're just doing a planning board vote right now. Okay, then so I'll second vote. Doug's You'll motion. Second. Great, Christine. thank you. Uh, it's Mandy. Yes. <laughs> Um, and, and I just wanted to answer, David, I hope that after you guys vote that my committee might be willing to entertain a motion too. So hopefully some committee members are thinking about a motion. Okay, so we have a motion. Is there anyone who uh, would like to uh, make a comment or a question to it? Uh, I see only one hand, Janet. So um, this so I have a question about when it would be appropriate to have separate public hearings and who would decide this? Would the chairs decide that? Which Would it be a vote of the two committees to have separate hearings? And what would be the circumstances that would lead to separate hearings? Um, I just, you know, it's, I, you know, I just, I'm sort of, I, just a simple question. That's a good question. Uh, I know Mandy Joe and I talked about this at one point and sometimes it's just as simple as it would be timing. Timing's not working. We can't get the two groups together. They're either having too many meetings or there's not enough members for a quorum. Um, that was the first uh, level that we saw that there would be a problem. Um, Mandy Joe, do you have anything to add? Uh, that that's that's definitely one of them. Um, another one would potentially be, and and my guess is, and and my committee hasn't fully talked about this, but we have mentioned sometimes there's been committee members that have mentioned maybe if a bylaw is um, suspected to have a whole lot of public interest, say, um, or that maybe the public interest might. Um, Necessitate, necessitate potential changes after hearings, um, that it might be wiser to have two instead of one. Um, I think, Janet, you mentioned some of that as a possibility on, on some things anyway, where, where it, it was either you or Michael that said, sometimes it's better to have two to give two opportunities for the public to formally weigh in. Um, and do, you, do, do we, do, does the CRC and planning board have to be 
voting on the same bylaw? Like, what if the planning board loves this zoning bylaw? It goes to the CRC and you don't like it. Can you hold that up? Are you going to vote it anyway? Like, what happens if we have two versions or there's not support amongst the CRC for it, but there might be support in the larger town council? So, do we have to be having a joint hearing about the exact same zoning bylaw? No. Um, so, it, I mean, in, in the sense that what, at least my, my understanding is in the sense that it has to be the same concept, um, but it could potentially have changes between your hearing, if there were two separate hearings, your hearing and CRC's hearing. Um, there, there's also, let, let me finish, there's also the ability for the town council after hearing, as was mentioned in town meeting, you know, and all of that, I think Chris and going through the town meeting stage, there'd be a hearing at planning board and then it could go through 20 different amendments before it even made it to town meeting. The town council has all complete ability to amend anything of on course. the floor anyway. And there isn't that requirement as, as Steve mentioned, there's no requirement for an additional hearing. So if the planning board feels like it has a zoning revision, it really likes it, it sends it up to the town council, town council sends it back, and then the CRC starts working on it. And we're going to be, we like our, we like our revision. You guys don't like it. You start changing it. But then we decide that at some point, whenever you're ready, if you're ready to have a joint hearing, maybe on two different bylaw ideas, or maybe the CRC just wants to sort of tank. One thing you have to remember, Janet, is <laughs> CRC is five of the voting members of town council. They're the ones who are going to vote on this and pass it. So we can propose all we want. I mean, this is the reality. We don't have the power to make it a bylaw. We can propose a million different things, but that's why we want to work towards agreement. And ideally it would be the same um, article. We're going to work with staff. Like why would we have something so radically different than CRC? Staff is, you know, the ones who are fully working on this and they would have best practices and certain recommendations. So it, it's a group effort and it always has been when it was going to town meeting to find compromise and common ground and people agreeing, maybe not wanting it exactly that way, but you have to send one thing forward. So ideally, you all want to be on the same page. Let, let me respond to one thing Janet said. If the hearing is held jointly, we'd have the same bylaw in front of us. But if we decide to split the hearings up, mm -hmm. it's entirely possible that the hearing, that the bylaw that the hearing, that the planning board holds the hearing on, by the time CRC holds the hearing on that same concept, the language it has changed. Changed. If they're not joint. So, as an evolving article does. So when we have the joint hearing, the goal is to have language that the planning board and the CRC all agree on. I can barely hear you, but I think yes. Ideally, you want it. a joint hearing would have the same language, and we want everybody on the same page. And staff would have to work with the different parties to get everybody to understand why certain parties weren't want something in a certain way. No. And if the planning board doesn't agree, then you would hold separate hearings, I guess. Okay. I can barely hear you, but I'm yeah. sorry if I've left. I'm, I'm still here. Okay. So thank you, Mandy Jo. Um, That's a very different understanding that I had. I'm, I'm glad. Okay. I can't really hear you. So um, David has hand up and then, whoops, sorry, it's moving. David and then Michael. And we do have a, a motion on the table. So this is where we're asking about um, questions to clarify for our vote. No, I, I just urge the planning board members to, um, I mean, I was feeling the love from Sarah earlier as a planning board member. <laughs> and that, that you know, we're, we're just, we're just, we're all, let's just start figuring out how we work together. And we'll, as the hypotheticals become real scenarios, that that'll that'll inform how that gets uh we hope improved um and and so that we can you know work out the kinks there are a lot of kinks we got to still you know vision 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 but you know i was i feel sufficiently loved that we're not going to be disrespected and and i would urge us all that we we vote with that 
good faith and optimism that we could um, benefit from these days. Thank you. Well said, David. Uh, Michael. Yeah, I'm all for good faith and optimism too. Um, and the, uh, the notion of let's try this and see what happens. Um, I don't want to, you, you all know how I feel about this and I don't want to be a, a stick in the mud here, but uh, if we're going to try this and see how it works, are we going to have a time limit on that? Is this going to, is there going to be a sunset on this? Is are we going to try it for two years and then reevaluate it? Uh, what's sort of next? Or is it just going to evolve? And uh, the problem is it's, it's written down. Uh, and it, something written down and approved then it has a different level of, of uh, importance than something that's just an idea that we're all talking about. So uh, what about that? What about a sunset? Uh, Mandy Jo? Um, I, I just wanted to respond to the it's approved and all. Um, I know as chair of CRC, I have heard clearly that from the planning board, whether or not this vote goes through, that it's a try. Um, this is set tentatively to be heard at the council meeting on the 15th but it is not up for a vote on the 15th. And in fact, um, one non-CRC member of the council um, indicated that maybe the council shouldn't even vote on this process, that it really is a CRC planning board process um, and, and that we need to just keep the, plan the council informed of how we're going to deal with all of this. I don't know how that conversation will go at the council, but I wanted to point that out because if it really doesn't get voted on by the council, if it really just stays our two processes um, that we're hoping to follow, then, then we can, in some sense, continually evaluate it after three or four different zoning amendments. We can see, was this working? Did joint hearings work? Did they not work? Um, and then come back to another joint meeting of the planning board and CRC and, and talk about it and see if we do need to revise it. Um, one thing that council in its first 16 months has found is that processes are almost never set in stone the first time you create them because you don't know how it's going to work until you actually have to do it. And so the council has revised a number of processes and committees have already revised a number of processes multiple times because they found the first thing they thought might work doesn't work. So at least this, this body of counselors is, is very open to trial and error and retry and go back and fix again. Thank you. Um, at this time, I just want to check in with the public um, and I don't think we have any comments at this time. I, Pam, are you there? I see we have I one am here. phone in caller. Did anyone pound? Star I, nine. No one has um, their hand up to share a comment in the attendees. Okay, I just want to make sure we weren't forgetting anyone. Um, I do see two members with their hands up, but I assume that they've already spoken and they're done. Um, I think we're ready to take a vote. Oh, Michael, you want to speak again? Yes, my hand was up because I had something that I wanted to say. Uh, okay. In response to what Manny Joe just said, um, okay. if if the uh, council approves this as a process, that casts it in a different kind of stone than if we just approve it. Is that right? It casts it in a harder stone. It's in granite as opposed to uh, uh, sandstone. I wouldn't say it's in granite. Um, <laughs> it it. <laughs> It adds one step to the process of revising simply. Um, the only step it would add is um, that the council would then have to refer it back to the planning board and CRC to revise. But I feel very confident in saying that if the CRC or the planning board approached the council president with a request and then to put on the agenda and then approach the council and said, you know, this process really isn't working. We need to revise it. That referral would happen immediately. Uh, Janet, do you want to speak again yes. before the vote? So We can't hear you at all. Um, I would be willing to try this like one or two, maybe three times. Um, you know, we have sort of easier issues, you know, we've been wait this we've been waiting with. 
but I'd be interested in trying this once or twice to on harder issues. I think it might get very thorny about, you know, when we, before we get to the joint hearing, working on language, working instead of just with seven members, working with 12 people um, who, you know, we're an independent body and that's, that's our strength and kind of, in a way, a small weakness. I'd be willing to try this, but I really don't want to say yes to this chart for the next year or two. Let's just see how this goes. And after two or three tries to revisit it, I think that um, it's it, if it's cumbersome and long and nothing gets done or we're arguing over language, um, which people are known to do, um, and the more people were involved, the more you know it is. Um, then you know I'd be I, I would be like okay we tried three times two times it just didn't work for us we'll have to figure out something else. Um, that's that's my suggestion. I, I wouldn't want to say this is how we're going to work forever or without a time limit to it or a number limit. Okay, so we have um, a motion and uh, I'm going to do roll call to vote um, to refresh what we had. Um, Chris or Pam in the minutes. It's been a long time now. Um, what did we have is a motion from David The motion was from Doug and it was Doug. Oh, me. thank you. It was Doug and seconded by David. I, I got part of it. I didn't get the whole thing. I think he just said to, um, I don't remember since it was Doug, it was very short. He just said to, to give this a try and move forward with it. For the board to express their support. For this protocol. Express their support and recommend and give it a try. Mm -hmm. So on that, I'll do a. Um, uh, I have a question. Yes. About the motion exactly. Uh, I think this is important because if we're approving the idea, that's one thing. If we're approving this document, that's a different thing. I'm willing to approve the idea, but I'm not willing to approve the document. I think the document is is not helpful. I think the idea is helpful. So what are we what are we voting? Well, why don't we make a uh, Doug maybe you can refine but to me I'm just trying to say that we as a planning board will start to follow this document as our procedure in working with CRC and the town council to get bylaws to them for approval. Christine you want me to repeat myself? Sure. More specifically? Sure. Yes. All right moved that the planning board express its support for the use of the flow chart for zoning bylaw amendments dated March 11th, 2020, revised May 6th, 2020, as the basis for its procedure in working on zoning bylaw amendments with the CRC. Thank you, Doug, for that clarification. And can I hear a second again for that? Sure, I second. Great. Okay, so are there any further questions? Michael, I see your hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I don't see any hands, so at this time I will roll call for the motion on the table. Michael Burtwistle? No. Maria Chow? Yes, approve. Jack Jemsick? Approve. David Levenstein? Approved. Doug Marshall? Affirmative. Janet McGowan? No. And myself, Christine Grimmullen, affirmative. So that's uh, five, two, zero. Uh, Mandy Joe, since it's a joint meeting, would, is there anything you'd like to do? I got to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> uh, is, is, is there anyone on my committee that would like to make a motion to recommend something to the town council? Evan. So first, you said that there was some opinion expressed by someone who was not on the council that this was not something that needed approval by the council? You're muted. I can't hear you. Mandy. Where I didn't even mute myself that time. <laughs> um, 
at, at agenda setting this, this afternoon, um, Councillor Brewer attended the meeting and when we were trying to decide whether to put this zoning flowchart on the agenda as a action item or as a presentation item, she um, believed that it should be a presentation item because it is more of a process for a committee than a council process. Um, so she made that argument um, very strongly. And so it will, if the votes go through tonight, appear on the agenda as a presentation item. And if there are counselors that believe it needs to be voted on based upon the referral vote, that the language of the referral vote that had us starting this in the first place, then it may turn into a vote at, the, at another meeting. Otherwise, it would not. I hope that's a little clearer. It, I mean, yes, as clear as, as clear as it could be, um, given that it's complex. So uh, I'm not sure how I feel about that yet. And I think I, I actually might agree with Alyssa on this. Um, I'd have to think about it. So um, I'm not sure that I'm ready to make a motion to recommend this to the council. I would be willing to make a motion that the CRC adopt this. Why don't we start with that motion and after the council meeting, if we need another one, we can work on another one. Okay. Uh, I kind of want Sarah's hands up, but I kind of want to hear. Oh, I see. Yep. If I see Sarah's hand. Sarah? Unmute, please. Okay. So I will say that um, because of work on a prior committee, um, I also feel like this would be considered one of the things that is a used work and that doesn't have to be approved by the town council. And also one thing that I would maybe have us think about is in order to maybe allay some fears the planning board has, maybe we could put a date in it that is like an official review date. And I'm not really sure how we would do that. Um, but if there could be some language in there so that they would feel more comfortable you know, that we are working with them as a team. Thank you, Sarah. Evan? <laughs> Thanks, Sarah, for both agreeing and also <laughs> complicating. <laughs> um, so I think that for now, I'd like to keep my motion simple because I'm not sure what date we would use to review. And I also think given the experience that I've had on a different committee that Sarah is very familiar with, um, we did continue, it was an iterative process of reviewing our own internal process and recommending changes as we saw them needed. So I, I worry sometimes that a date that we say we're going to review this in six months means that we put off reviewing it until six months instead of doing things as we see them. So I think I'm going to put forward, no, I think I am going to put forward just a simple motion that says um, that I move that the CRC adopt the flow chart described in the document flow chart for zoning bylaw amendments march 11 2020 revised may 6 2020. do i hear a second second shalini shalini seconds is there any additional conversation shalini oh you just lowered your hand Seeing none, we will move to a vote of the CRC. Um, I will do a roll call. I think I'm going to try and do this in order. I don't always get the alphabetical order correct, though. So, Shalini. Yes. Um, Mandy is a yes. Uh, Evan. Yes. And then it's Steve. Yes. And Sarah. Yes. That is a unanimous. Um, so if I may, Christine, yes, at this time, I, I want uh, the CRC has concluded its agenda. Um, I want to thank the planning board for hosting us tonight. Um, I want to thank you guys for being willing to work with us on zoning amendments and the master plan. I know that one's in process right now. Um, and you guys have been hearing stuff and we look forward to seeing what those revisions might come out of your, your committee looking like. Um, we appreciate your work on all of that. I want to say we're looking forward to the next two weeks where we will be in front of you and joining you again, especially next week for a temporary zoning article for a hearing. We will get to try this out in some sense for the very first time, even though we're kind of starting it in the middle of it. 
Um, but thank you all for your time. Uh, we appreciate it and we look forward to working with you all. And at that, um, unless I see any hands from the fellow committee members of mine, I'm going to adjourn the CRC meeting portion of this at 9.16 p.m. to allow the planning board to continue on with its agenda. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. See y'all real Thank soon. You Thank you. Um, at this point, it is 916 and I would, um, I've been requested to that we take a five minute restroom break. So if we can let um, Amherst Media know that we're just taking a five minute break um, so all the members can go off, get what you need, and then we'll be back here. I have 917, so at 922, we will resume. Um, so we're going to hit the next thing, which was um, five old business. Chris, do we have anything on old business? Excuse me, I'm eating a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> there is no old business. Um, okay, so we'll move to uh, item six, new business A, temporary zoning, introduction and preliminary discussion of proposed zoning amendment Zoning bylaw article 14, temporary zoning regarding permitting for certain uses during COVID-19 emergency and its aftermath. Planning board members discussion only, public hearing scheduled for June 10th, which is next Wednesday. So at this point, um, I'll turn it over to Chris, uh, if she's done with her cookie. Yep. And um, if you can just sort of give us uh, what's going on, a heads up, so we're ready for next week. Yeah, so the idea here is that, um, you know, so many businesses have been suffering lately. Um, some businesses have closed. Um, most of our favorite restaurants aren't really operating very much right now. And um, we wanted to think about what we could do in terms of zoning to make life e easier for them. So we came up with this idea of um, <clears throat> having a, a, a zoning amendment that would allow certain things to happen temporarily, but it might also allow certain other things to happen long-term. And it's really, um, it's all about allowing uh, approvals to happen on an administrative level and not requiring someone to go through, um, you know, a two month planning board process or a three month zoning board of appeals process. So, <clears throat> Um, I, I'll just uh, tell you a little about it. It really only applies to um, certain zoning districts. So the business BG zoning district, BL, which is, um, there are three BLs around the downtown and there's also a BL out on University Drive. The BVC Business Village Center, which is in North Amherst, Pomeroy Village and um, I don't think if there's any other BVC, I'm sure there is. Oh yeah, East Amherst, where um, Mr. Amir's um, building is. BN, Business Neighborhood, which is where the Elements Hot Tub Spa is, and the Commercial Zoning District. So in those business zoning districts, we would, um, uh, for uses that are currently permitted by site plan review <coughs> or by special permit, and for other, some pre-existing non-conforming uses, for instance, there's a pizza parlor on uh, the corner of Fearing Street and Sunset, I believe. Um, so for those kinds of businesses in those districts, for retail establishments, personal care establishments, and food and drink establishments, and also for accessory uses <coughs> that are associated with these establishments such as um, outdoor dining, live entertainment, and drive-through facilities. So the idea is that the building commissioner <coughs> would be given the authority in place of the permit granting board or special permit granting authority. <coughs> I'm sorry, the cookie must have gone down the wrong way to allow these things to happen. Design review would not be required um, as it is currently in the BG zoning district. There would be an application process that would be set up and we've already set it up actually <coughs> based on the governor's um, order 
but I'll tell you about that in a, little, in a few minutes. And the building commissioner would consult with me, the planning director, to make sure that what we were doing was in line with what had been done previously. For instance, if there was a business that had been approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals, it was a certain type of business that offered you know, food and drink and um, had outdoor dining. Well, what we would look back and say, well, what kinds of conditions did the Zoning Board of Appeals put on that particular um, use? Um, you know, we would be very conservative in our um, dealing with these, but we would be in, in the same line as the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning Board, but it wouldn't require this lengthy process of approval. And um, the period of time that we're talking about is 180 days, so we are talking about temporary zoning um, to allow this kind of a, approval to happen. Um, however, there might be some uses that would be new uses that, you know, say there was a downtown um, uh, storefront that was empty as a result of a restaurant going out of business. Well, if there were a new uh, person who wanted to take over that space and start a new restaurant um, and perhaps have some outdoor dining, that that person would also be able to take advantage of this, um, this Article 14 zoning process and you know, potentially be able to stay there. I mean, if he's gonna put the money into um, renovating the, the, the space and then putting um, tables and chairs outside, well, certainly he, sh he should be able to you know, take advantage in the long-term of his um, interior renovation. The exterior use of sidewalks would be um, on a temporary basis. And accompanying this zoning amendment would be the ability of the town manager, this isn't part of zoning, but it would be something that town council would grant to the town manager authorization to allow certain parts of the um, right of way to be used for seasonal outdoor dining. Um, and, and this could take the form of using uh, parts of the sidewalk or parts of the street itself, potentially where there are parallel parking spaces along the street, or it might take the um, take the, the shape of using a parking lot. You know, there's a parking lot over in Prey Street. There's one in, on Spring Street. There's one right, right out in front of Town Hall. So those all might potentially be used as um, places for outdoor dining. There's also a, a little plaza in the Boltwood uh, garage area that could be used. So we're in the process of mapping out these areas. But um, the essential idea is that the building commissioner would be given authority during this 180 day period or six months to allow these kinds of uses to occur um, along with their accessory uses. And we think it would really give a boost to the, um, to the businesses downtown that are suffering so badly right now and get them back on track. Um, so I think that's pretty much the extent of my presentation. We, you will get a more um, complete presentation from the building commissioner who's planning to attend the public hearing next Wednesday. Um, now the governor, I should mention, I will uh, extend my presentation a bit to say that the governor has um, given an order um, that allows uh, outdoor dining um, to occur without going through site plan review and special permit process throughout the state. And he's also allowed the local um, licensing commissions uh, to extend the area, the premises they call it, where alcohol can be served. So in other words, um, someone who has a restaurant, you know, say Judy's or something like that, Judy's may um, want to set up tables along the sidewalk and serve the same things that they serve inside their restaurant as they would out on the sidewalk. And in order to do that, ordinarily they would need an extension of their premises from the ABCC, and they would also need it from our local licensing commission. So the governor has given the local commissions um, the ability to grant those extension of premises. A lot of this is based on the fact that, I should have introduced this uh, in the beginning, but the fact that none of these businesses are going to be able to operate at full capacity inside. Um, at first, they're gonna be limited to 25% of their um, capacity and then you know probably work up to 50% but 
but for quite a while, they're only going to be able to operate at a fraction of their normal capacity. So if we can give them some ability to extend their uh, area where they can serve food and drink to the outdoors, this would be beneficial to them. Um, now, the reason to keep our Article 14 going, even though the governor has um, issued his order, well, our Article 14 applies to some new uses, as I described, if there's an, a vacant storefront and uh, someone wants to come and set up a, a restaurant um, <clears throat> there, our Article 14 would apply to that. It also applies to personal care establishments, such as um, you know a hairdresser that might want to set up a, um, a chair out on a sidewalk. I can imagine Matt's Barbershop doing that back in the Boltwood Walk area. And also um, retail shops that might wanna uh, put some of their wares out on the sidewalk. Um, so it's a little bit broader. And we've also gotten um, word from our town council, Joel Bard, that it's also a more stable form of allowing these things to happen. The governor's order is great, but the, it's up to the governor as to when he's going to um, you know, rescind the order. He could rescind it soon. Right now it's scheduled to be rescinded November 1st, or I believe it's either that date or sooner. So he could rescind it sooner than November 1st. Um, but our order would go through probably at least through the end of the year. So it's a little more um, broad in its scope and a little more stable. Um, and Joel Bard has reviewed this and he's made several suggestions about in improving the wording. Um, and this is the wording that he agrees with. And um, so I guess, um, you know, people can, can ask questions or make comments. Oh, and also I wanted to say, Janet submitted some comments, which um, Pam has on her slideshow here. And then I submitted Janet's comments to Rob Mora um, the building commissioner, and he wrote in response. So we have both Janet's um, comments and Rob's um, and Rob's responses. But why don't we look at the original language first, and then see if anybody has any questions? Okay. So I see Michael's hand. There Michael. we are. Okay. Oh. I was I was muted. I think this is a great idea. Um, I have one question though. Uh, the 100, the 180 days takes us to January 1st, something like that. Depends on when this gets approved. Um, really the last two months or three months even of that is not going to be really useful for outdoor dining. Uh, so is that a good date? The other part of that question is, um, a, 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 an establishment is going to have to invest in some outdoor tables, umbrellas and chairs and bollards to mark off the space or something like that. Does this permission then expire automatically uh, at the 180 days or whenever, whenever the day is? And therefore next summer, they can't use the stuff that they've invested in or they'd have to have a new application. How would that work? It seems to me that would, if this is a good idea, and I think it is a great idea, uh, the time frame ought to be a, extended at least to include summer of 21 as well as the remainder of summer of 20. So I think, may I answer? Yes, please. I think it, it somewhat depends on whether they're using their own property or whether they're using um, town right of way. So if they're using their own property, they could probably, um, you know, extend this past the 180 days. I think that would probably have to be a discussion on a case by case basis with the building commissioner. Um, if they're using town right of way, we wouldn't necessarily want them to continue to use it past the 180 days. Um, so does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, it does. But it also raises an issue that if, if they're going to have to invest in these outdoor furnishings and it's only going to be useful for three months or so, uh, that's not going to be much of a stimulus. Um, may I respond partially to that? Yes, please. So one idea is that the town is um, considering purchasing some furniture, um, such as picnic tables and potentially um, some sort of barrier, particularly if the work would be done in the town right of way. So if they did, um, if they did that, that would take away some of the expense that um, people would have to make. But um, you know, there there are probably 
entities like uh, Johnny's Tavern, for instance, they already have a patio area. They could easily set up um, something on their own property and potentially there they could, you know, have something this year and then could carry it on into next year. They would probably invest in the um, furniture and then, you know, be able to use it next year. But, you know, we haven't gotten into that level of detail. I think it really would be um, kind of on a case by case basis as to exactly um, how this how this would be managed. But that's certainly a question that you can ask the building commissioner when he um, comes before you next Wednesday. Yeah, that's good. I'm not trying to solve the restaurant's problems. Just a thought, if they can't have people inside, a lot of them will have furniture inside that they could bring out. It wouldn't be weatherproof. They might have to bring it back in or cover it, but maybe they can make use of some of what they already have since they won't be inside. Um, or maybe there's rental things. So yeah, Rob might be able to give us some insight more on what the restaurants um, are thinking. When we have the joint hearing next week, do you know if representatives from the bid or the chamber are coming? Because you know they kind of speak for the restaurants and they might have some ideas of how this is gonna be helpful um, or any tweaks or suggestions they have. I can certainly invite them. Okay. I think that's a great idea. All right, thank you. Um, I see Janet McGowan's hand. Um, I have questions. Um, I do. I do see the urgency, especially after my trip to Wellfleet, where um, you know restaurants were shut down except for takeout, and um, you know it's 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 very dire for our local businesses. Um, I had um, a few questions, and one of them is: Is this a permanent permit? Is this just a permit for, or is it a permit? And is it a permit? No, permit Janet, to... can I interrupt for a moment? Is Are these the questions that you submitted to Chris that no. you're asking now, or are these additional questions? Because if they're the same questions, I'll have Pam pull them up on the, um, on the screen. Um, is this, no, this is, this, actually, these are proposed changes to the zoning language, the bylaw language. But, um, so I, these are just questions I have that. Um, In addition, to this document with other suggestions you have. Yeah, so in a, okay. the answers to this question to help me understand these amendments, like if these amendments are needed. So and why don't we go back to the original document, Pam? Yeah, so the que first question is, is, are these permanent permits or are they just for 180 days? Because that's not clear from, the, from this proposed bylaw. Um, and so I, I think for existing businesses, I could understand the urgency of getting just getting people out, you know, getting haircuts outdoors, people eating outdoors, you know, whatever business can do outside, I could see that. And so, but the question was, is this a permanent permission to do that? So in some cases it might be, say in the case of Johnny's Tavern, if they can set something up on their um, patio, which I think they were considering doing anyway, and they would have had to go through a three month process with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, the building commissioner could give them um, an, an administrative approval to do that, and that would continue through to next year. But if there was something where someone was setting something up in the town right of way or on the sidewalk um, <clears throat> that, you know, would, would revert back to being needed as a public way, eventually, once more people come to town, then, um, you know, that wouldn't be an appropriate thing to do on a permanent basis. And that type of um, permit would expire at the end of the 180 days. So that's why I was saying it's it's really kind of on a case by case basis as to how we would um, handle these things. And you know the building commissioner is pretty strict. I must say, um, my experience with him is that he's letter of the law, and he would always look back to the way that the zoning board of appeals or the planning board would have dealt with this particular issue. He's not someone who's going to let, you know, mayhem reign. And he is also, um, he's in charge of the inspectors, the uh, health inspectors, and, and they're very careful too. So I really feel like putting this in his hands is putting it in, in very responsible hands to think about this kind of thing really carefully. Um, my second question is about the new businesses. I think I, I I, I read that it, um, 
it takes an average of seven months to get the permits to open a new business. And I wondered if you could just walk, explain to me why that takes so long. So obviously some businesses go faster, some go slower, but what are the steps that take so long? And then um, does it matter if you're a retail facility or you're a bar or you're a restaurant or you're a bookstore or you're in a neighborhood like next to houses? Like what, what is it that, what are the steps and what makes something longer than another thing? So in terms of retail, um, usually in the downtown area, retail already gets an administrative approval from the building commissioner. Um, mm -hmm. If they're not making any changes to the exterior other than signs and lighting, there's no reason for them to go to the planning board or go to the zoning board of appeals. Um, for a restaurant, um, a class two restaurant, class two restaurant um, is something that serves alcohol and um, you know, could be within 150 feet of a residential uh, dwelling unit. Um, so they're more, more highly regulated. They're, they can be open late, uh, as late as uh, after 1130. Um, I think they can be open until one o'clock or something like that. So um, those kinds of things, those class two restaurants do take a long time. It takes approximately three months if everything goes well. Um, to get a, a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals from the time you apply. And then, um, of course, there are uh, building permit requirements and liquor license requirements and common vitular license requirements. And you need to then do all of the work that you need to do in the interior of the space in order to um, you know, build it to the way you want to operate. And then you need to get that approved and inspected. So you know, probably from the beginning until you finally open a place might take as long as seven months. I don't think the permitting itself would take that long, but um, it could take that long to get a, a, a place up and running. If you have an existing restaurant and you just need um, a, a permit to start operating, you know, you can um, probably do that in three months, but um, this would give people a uh, an advantage because it would happen more quickly. This could happen in as little as 10 days. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Hey, I don't see any other hands up. Um, Chris, do you, so yeah. Janet submitted suggestions to change the amendment and then Mr. Moore gave comments back. Do we need yeah, to go over those or are you just sending that out to us? What I'd like to do is, um, email them to you. I couldn't email them to you today because it would have been a breach of the open meeting law. So I'd like to email them to you and have you consider them over the next week and I'll email you Rob's um, responses and you can evaluate them and then um, have an opportunity to discuss them next week. So this doesn't show Mr. Moore's comments. These are just, These are this Janet's is just comments Janet's and then you we'll get a separate. Them. Okay. All right. Great. So we will watch for those. At this time, um, I want to ask, um, and then I'll call, I think Janet still has her hand up. Um, I just want the board, at this time, if you have any questions or you think something might be helpful to get answered or for staff to look into, or if, if there's certain people that should be at the joint hearing, because that's next week with CRC, it will be a joint hearing and we'll both vote on it. Um, sending it to town council. So uh, Janet, do you have something else you want to say? Yes, I actually, I sent these out as just to say, these are the amendments I'm suggesting, but I didn't give the reasoning. And so um, I could, um, how do I get my thoughts to the- You point? say it right now. Okay, so um, I think I'm okay with, I would, I would make it to my, my, my sheet. Can you I think go back I, to Janet's um, suggestions, Pam? I can. Thank you. Is that so? So these are suggestions you want the building commissioner and and Christine to change on the current Article Fourteen. Well, I, because we're in sort of an abbreviated process, I was hoping to talk to the planning board about them, um, and. For me, if the permit is just for six months or you know even till next summer, I wouldn't suggest the first change. Um, I think it should be clear that the permits 
so I would, I would, I'm actually, if it's a temporary permit and then it will come back to the planning board, the ZBA, um, <coughs> and you know, the, the crisis, which seems like it's going to go on for a long time. Um, if it's a permanent permit, I would suggest the first change. If it's a temporary permit, which is my second, um, my second change is a, on the first section, then I would be fine with just leaving the uses in. So, um, so I'd like to, and so I just think that we need, you know, I see this as, as a time of crisis, but I also feel like the, if we need, there's no reason why these things can't come back to the boards for more consideration. And once the permit is issued, if it's permanent and it's not working out, or addition, additional conditions need to be made, we don't have a lot of power to do that. And so there's a lot of you know, helpfulness in having a bunch of heads looking at different conditions and different expertise. And so I'm fine on the, dealing with the crisis, getting businesses open, issuing a temporary permit, but at some point there is time to reflect and come back. Um, so that's the reasoning in the first um, application process section. Um, I also was very concerned that with this process being so abbreviated and so quick that people who are affected by the decision, the abutters, who would include not just the property owners, but the tenants in a building, the, the uh, businesses nearby and neighbor, neighbors living nearby could easily have no notice whatsoever that the application has been made and a decision has been made. And so I, added the section that says on the day of the application, the applicant shall notify all property owners, business owners and residents within 300 feet of the applicant's place of business. Um, it's still a tight schedule, but at least people will have notification. You know, if it's mailed out, I don't think it's gonna help because it's taken me five days to get a packet mailed to me. And so easily somebody could open their mail on a Friday, realize this application has been made days a, a week, almost a week ago, try to get some information and the decision has been made. So I, I was very concerned about like a butters getting notice and having an ability to participate in the permitting decision or the, the administrative thing. So I think that's really important. And then on the decision section, I thought 10 days was really tight and I thought we should give more time to the building commissioner and Chris to, you know, look at and process because if you get 11 applications in and you have 10 working days, that just seemed really tight. And then I threw a little language in for more flexibility, which is 15 business days of receipt of the complete application or later if reasonably necessary. So I just thought that that fudge would be needed to take a little pressure off of our um, town staff who seem very busy all the time. Pam, can you go to the next page? Yep. And then I'm having trouble seeing my own writing here. I think that was the end of that the is the end. Oh, um, great. Yeah. Okay. So we hear you, Janet, and then we'll also get uh, an email with Mr. Moore's comments on that. Well, thanks for that. I, I, just I was trying to yeah. describe those. Uh, sure. Go for it. Well, Mr. Moore felt that the suggestions would significantly change and limit the effect of the proposal. Um, he thought that in, in terms of the uses, mm -hmm. The change would only allow us to consider helping existing businesses and wouldn't provide an opportunity to help fill in the vacant storefronts. Um, he thought that the process, um, does this mean that six months from when it was approved? Oh, well, you know what? I'm, I'm like not in the <laughs> frame of mind to read this one. Read it yourselves. Um, I'll email it to you tomorrow and um, yeah, and we'll discuss. I guess the, the point is, Chris, that Mr. Moore is considering her suggestions. Yes. And the powers that be, all of you that are working on this um, Article 14, will consider this. And uh, I assume this week we will get a final, final version that we actually consider that would be voted on next Wednesday. I don't think we're going to change the version that you're going to be looking at. I think that you will be um, hearing from Janet about what her suggestions are and hearing from the building commissioner about what his thoughts are on Janet's suggestions. And then you can change the wording next Wednesday. I don't think we're going to change anything between now. And okay, that's good to know. 
All right, so we'll watch our emails. Thank you, Janet. And um, we should all read this closely and, and give it some thought. Um, and we will have presentations next Wednesday. Mr. Moore will actually formally um, describe it again and, and that kind of thing. So I don't see any other hands. Are there any other questions at this time? Heads up, you wanna give Chris or anything? All right, I don't see any. So um, we can move on to new business item B, which something did get mailed out um, today. It's um, yet another bylaw change that will be coming to us on, um, where are we? June 17th, um, this went to town council and they talked about it, I believe on Monday. Uh, from what I've heard, it got, favorably uh, received and they're eager to move. Um, so it's something that's been coming back and forth to us for over a year and a half. Um, part of what's driving it is um, the vote we have, we require on a site plan review right now is um, it's still at at five, it never got adjusted from when we went from nine members to seven members. So um, that needs to be adjusted. And then with further thought, um, it's just looking at best practices and um, what other towns do, uh, how we can adjust so that site plan reviews, which are sort of a by right compromise situation, um, can be um, can be passed with a fair or just a majority rather than a super majority, which is what we have right now with our five members. So um, it's pretty straightforward wording. It's not much to review. It's just that one page, uh, not even a third of a page we got. Um, so at this time, it it won't be coming to us. Again, it will be another joint hearing on the 17th, but if I'll be looking for hands for any questions or comments or anything we wanna ask Chris to look into or anything like that. Well, um, I, may I say something? Yeah, please it do. Really did come to us from um, the CRC. Mm -hmm. And they asked us to um, hold a public hearing on it. Yes, and they have brought it to town council. Yep. Um, that uh, were in favor, in general favor of it and are um, waiting to receive it after the joint hearing. So um, if there's questions, I'm going to, I think Janet's hand still up. So I think she, I'm going to skip Janet for the moment. I'll go to David. And then if Janet's hand is still up, I'll go to her and whoever else. David. Yes. Hi. Thank you. I, I support this. Um, revised amendment. However, I'm a little concerned that I, I don't think it there, I think there's further work that needs to be done. Um, although I would not want that to um, delay approval of this amendment. In section 11.4 of the current zoning bylaw, as I understand it, 11.41 and so they here's my point christine you asked me chris this is my this would be my work for you i really regret saying that knowing that you're flat out um my, my understanding of 11.41 is that it allows appeal rights for site plan review decisions which are in 11.24 so subject to this section um within 30 days of a decision from the commissioner, from the commissioner, the building commissioner to issue a permit. That's different than the appeal rights granted elsewhere in the zoning bylaw for special permits. That's in section 10.1. And I think that they should be consistent. I think that the any appeal of a site plan decision should have a consistent consistent time frame to an appeal by a special permit granting authority 
which is refers to the statute in 40A. I believe that's 20 days from the decision of the body, not of the building commissioner. And sure. so I think there's further work that needs to be done on 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 on, on making the site plan decision um, process more consistent and effective in the working of the zoning bylaw overall. What was that 10 point something? The, the 10 point one. 10 point one. Point one. I have to say this wasn't on my radar at all, but I know and, and, and I don't want to I don't want to flummox the, uh, the the drive to revise this site plan um, voting requirement, which I believe is consi is consistent in and should be should be approved. Um, and so my intent is not to undermine this you know, baby stepping towards uh, amending the current zoning bylaw. I'm just suggesting that, I'm just saying that further work needs to be done in this because of the way in which the bylaw is written that the decision for site plan review and a potential appeal should be not longer than a potential appeal for a special permit is my basic point. So there is no appeal period for a site plan review. Well, what's 11.41? Someone can appeal a site plan review ad infinitum. Exactly. So what, what does that have to do with voting requirements? If the planning board grants, votes on, and decides on a site plan review. The, the appeal to that decision should be limited by 40A, which is consistent with section 10.1, as opposed to being ad infinitum to up to where the building commissioner issues permits. I think that the, the, the site plan decision should be a reasonably um, um, definite point upon at which appeals can be made by aggrieved parties, but it shouldn't be so indefinite that the uncertainty about being able to start a project is, is left till after the building commissioner issues permits. Chris, I think your hands up. Is it? No. Am I, am I making? Am I? I, I I'm hoping. I'm. I'm I, I. I think I'm making sense, Chris, but perhaps I'm not. It's very late for me, and this is long um, meeting. But, but. Well, if it's important to you, David, there, there's. I'm sure there's something to it. Chris, could you look into this and let us know, and maybe even have a conversation with Mr. Levenstein to sort of fine tune? I think a conversation tomorrow might be the best thing because I'm not in the best. Um, no, I agree. I totally agree. <laughs> Analyze but, uh, you know, and, and again, this is not to, my, my comment is not to challenge the um, intent to change the voting plan requirement as a consequence of the change of the membership number of the planning board. My comment is intended to try to make more consistent the whole site plan and special permitting granting authority and the appeal rights that are that are granted under it. And it seems to me that they're not. That's all, thank you. Okay, so you two continue this and then if there's something to bring back to us, please do. Thank you, David. Um, I'm gonna call on Janet and then I see Doug's hand up. I have a quick question about this. Um, partly after the, um, the, the seminar I just attended, under this language, if, if, if the planning board only had four people voting on the site plan review, the majority would be three. And are people comfortable with that? Like, the, do the, are people thinking, 
um, it's a majority decision, but we want at least four members. Is that because I, I that that seminar got me thinking about how small a majority decision could be. So I, that's just my. So if the answer is yes, it could just be three people. That that affects my thinking. But it it could be three. And the thing to remember is that this is site plan review, not a special permit. Um, and I can't even remember the last time we've only had four members at yeah. a meeting. And Chris, as the chair, um, and Chris as director, we make huge efforts to try to keep big votes. Like we had an SPR last week on a three season porch, you know. Yeah. I would have been okay with three of us deeming that okay and passing it. Um, but for things like buildings and such like that, they usually take many, many meetings to ever get to the point of a final vote. And usually the chair, in my experience, we make a tremendous effort to make it on a meeting that we would have as many members as possible, um, if not seven, six at a minimum, you know, um, so I'm just looking over the last five years, just general practices to how, how it works. But yes, you're right. In, in essence, it could be three only, but sometimes I think that's just fine. Let them build their three season porch. Um, the other thing I just wanted to add is I asked this question on the planners listserv about what towns had, you know, the super majority for site plan review mm -hmm. and some towns did and they, the only problem they occasionally found with it was an issue of having a quorum, but they, they didn't see much difference. And they also had, you know, um, you know, it, it seemed like there was often agreement on the board and stuff like that. So they didn't see a problem with maintaining it. I just wanted to pass that information in. Thank you. Uh, Doug, I think you're out there. Yeah, I'm out here. Um, having spent most, much of this evening talking about the process on a flow chart for zoning bylaw amendments, I guess I'm a little surprised to see this just suddenly pop up and hear that CRC is gonna recommend this to, to town meeting, to town council. Are we already, uh, are we being consistent with the flow chart as we just discussed it or are we already running amok? Thank you. Um, so this is a long history. This has been out there for over a year and a half. Um, and it was set to move, I knew of it before COVID. So what happened is COVID happened and there's a lot of stuff that sort of, including the process, that flow chart you saw, um, a lot of things have been held up and bottlenecked up. And this is part of the reason why we have so much coming on our plate right now because things are starting to move and it's built up over months. So, um, and people have been aware of this having to be adjusted since, since right after the charter was finalized because part of this is, you know, something that at the time they didn't adjust even though it's just flat numbers. Um, they didn't want to touch numbers and keep it really clean, easy when they did the bylaw review and they, you know, changing out like select board with town council and that kind of thing. So this has actually been around for a while, but um, I think it shows that town council and CRC, now that there's a process and they have, re, you know, they're going to have elections coming up a year from this fall. I think there's a lot of, you know, the politics of it. They want to get some things moving and, and, start making changes. So I think this is just the beginning of a lot of things that are going to be coming to us. Chris, I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, Janet, your hand's still up. Do you have another question? Or no, okay. Um, anyone else have any questions right now they want to ask? Um, I do see Mandy Joe is there. I don't know if you're even listening to us, Mandy Joe, but if you could just confirm that this went to, I believe it's came out of CRC, but it went to town council for discussion, I think, this week. Um, yeah, I see your hand. Great. If you could just confirm what happened this week. So, yeah. Um, to, to answer Doug's question, um, you could consider this coming in on the third 
box of the chart at um, my request as a counselor, if you want to think of it that way. Um, it was brought to my attention at some point that this number um, probably should have been modified and this whole bylaw should have been looked at at the time of bylaw review. And so as a counselor, I wanted to move it forward um, to, to do that. So I had requested a, a bunch of things. Um, and one of that was um, the council refer it for hearing and everything and, and hearing and recommendation. Um, so, so I would say it started on the third box of the flow chart that we talked about earlier. Um, it has had a very brief hearing, not, and I don't even want to use the word hearing, a very brief discussion in CRC. Um, CRC has not made any recommendations at this point. That discussion was based on a packet materials um, that were in the actual planning board packet for the planning board meeting in March that was canceled, um, is the best way to describe it when COVID hit. Um, and their CRC briefly, briefly, briefly talked about options um, and, and kind of favored a majority vote option. At Monday's council meeting, when it was on the agenda for referral, it was actually on the agenda on the consent part of the agenda and one counselor removed it from consent because that counselor wanted to ask a question and make a comment. Um, and so before referral, there was a very brief discussion at the council meeting on this. And the two counselors that spoke at that meeting also expressed favorability for this amendment. But again, the council has not had a full discussion. It generally would wait until after a hearing for the full discussion and CRC's policy in line with the flow chart that was mentioned is to not vote at all or make any recommendations until after public hearings. Um, and all. So I, I hope that answers a couple of questions that I heard. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. That clarifies. We'll see you next week. Um, I see Michael's hand up. Uh, yes. Is, are we having um, a joint public hearing on this issue next week? No, on the 17th. On the, but it's because notices have to happen and I'll yeah, like back on but the flow chart. But this is going to be a joint meeting, a public meeting of the CRC and the planning board. Yep. Okay. Hopefully we'll be really good at it by the 17th. It's been advertised already. Okay. Thanks, Chris, for that. Um, are there any other questions? If not, um, we'll move on to um, the next topic. I don't see any hands. So Chris, we'll move on to item seven, form A, A and R subdivision applications. And I know we have some, we had some in our packet. If you dig towards the back, there's two of them. Two of them, yep. So let's see. Um, what do you wanna start, Pam? Which one do you wanna start with, Pam? The one on Harlow Drive? Yeah. I believe I have Harlow Drive first, yes. Thank you. So um, Dana Corson owns both of these properties, the property that's outlined in yellow and the property that's outlined in turquoise. And he would like to combine them into one parcel. And I think we have, do we have a picture of the um, A&R? No, we don't. Of the actual application? Yeah. No, but, it, but yeah. it was in their yeah. packet. The front page. Oh, it was, okay, great. Yeah. It doesn't well, say much, but it's there. Plan. Right, which is why I didn't put it on here. All right, so um, anyway, it's really just a combination of the yellow lot and the turquoise lot. And um, there's no reason to think that subdivision control would be needed here. Um, this really isn't the creation of a subdivision. It's got more than the correct amount of frontage for this, um, for this, uh, for the RN zoning district. Um, and more than the correct amount of lot area. So will you authorize um, Christine Gray Mullen to sign this on behalf of the planning board? Yes. 
Yes. Um, you can click your hands on if a majority of, oh. Yes. David, I, have a, I, have a I don't know how, but David's there twice. That's amazing. Um, He's been there the whole time. But both times. I'm working on fixing the vote. I'm, work, I'm perfecting it for November. Mr. Mr. Marshall has a question. Yes, Doug. Yeah, the uh, application form says the proposal is going from an existing number of four lots to a proposed number of two lots. And I don't understand that, especially the way Chris described it. Well, this must have been written by um, the applicant. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they did that. Um, it's really, well, there were three lots originally. You can see where the purple line is. Mm. Um, and the, so the turquoise lot used to be two lots and it was combined a while ago. Um, so now they're really going from two lots to one lot. So I don't know why they said okay. two lots. It doesn't How, many it. How many acres is it? How many acres? That's a good question. Uh, um, I, I don't have my, I don't have the ability to get into GIS right now, but it's bigger than what was previously allowed to be, to have a um, house on it. I think that there was some um, kind of a right of way you can see between the purple line and the turquoise line to the east, there was some type of right of way in there. And it eventually um, the person who owns the yellow lot acquired half of it and the other half went to the fellow on the east. Um, so I can circulate a copy of the ANR, the actual ANR plan to you tomorrow, if that would help. And then you can uh, let me know whether you would authorize Christine to sign it. Um, or you can just authorize her now. I can't really tell you exactly how much acreage there is there. I'm going to guess probably 30,000 square feet. These lots are small. The frontage lots yeah. are small. Um, is, uh, is that turquoise lot a buildable flag lot at, at the way it stands now? No. No. Huh. I don't think it could contain the building circle. Again, I'm not sure of that, but it doesn't look like it could. I doubt it could, right. And are there two dwelling units on the on the yellow lot, or is that a dwelling unit and a garage? It's a dwelling garage. unit and a garage. Yeah. I think we should one just, acre total. I think we should just Thank let you, Maria. This. It, it, so it's one acre combining the two lots. Yes. Yeah. I'm good. I'm good. Okay, I'm good. Um, I see David or Doug, your hands up. Do you have, and then David? Oh, nope, he's gone. David, you got a question on this? Um, no, I don't. Oh, I'm sorry. He's gone. Okay. Yeah, so the hands are up. I think we're good with it. So um, I still haven't signed the one um, that we last okayed because we were waiting for the town engineer to finish something. So that one's I'll sign tomorrow and this one. And now we have a third one. There's the third one. The third one has to do with um, Eversource. Eversource wants to um, purchase some property. And this doesn't show the a &R either. I'm so sorry. Oh. Chris, this we didn't get those electronically. Sorry. Is this the same parcel that the town declined the purchase? It looks to be. Zala? Zala? Zala property? Is that right? Yeah, it looks to me like it is. Yeah, that 2A7, and yeah, it really does. It, it's got the access between the wetlands in the southwest corner and then the small buildable area shaded in the middle. Yep. I agree. Pam, we don't have the electronic copy of this. No, I'm sorry. Oh gosh. So, so we do, we have no plan of of the split that is proposed here, right? I don't know what I'm looking at. No, I don't either. I mean, I know what I'm what I should be looking at. But I'm not looking at it now. So I'm going to have to send you um, the electronic. I'll have to somehow figure out how to scan 
or get it from the surveyor, um, the survey can plan. And I think I might have can we email. conduct this by email or can, does this need to wait till our meeting next week? Well, it could wait till the meeting next can week. Can we move it to next yeah. next week on the 10th? I mean, it'll only take a few minutes I think if we have the right stuff. I move we postpone this to the next meeting. Anyone want to second that? Yep, Janet, I saw her hand. Uh, I'm good with that. June 10th. Okay. Yeah. So do I need to do a roll call or can we just roll this to the next? No, I think you can just put it on the next meeting. Okay, good. So you're good to sign Harlow Drive, but not this yep. one. Okay. I'll sign two of them tomorrow. I think I see you at noon. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll do the next one next the following week. Yep. Uh, are there uh, item uh, eight upcoming ZBA applications? Any of those, Pam? Nothing new. Great. Uh, nine upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications? Nope, nothing new. Great. Move on to uh, 10 planning board committees and liaison reports. First, I want to give a huge shout out to Jack Jemsick. Um, he was asked by PV. Uh, PC to be on their executive committee. So that's very nice. He's got more exciting meetings to go to, though they're probably on Zoom right now. Um, but anyways, that's a great honor. It gives uh, Amherst a good place to be on the executive board. And I know Jack uh, really likes the organization and is probably really excited about this. So um, Jack, do you have a report or anything you want to say? No, or there hasn't been anything. Um you know, recently, but. Um, well, shout out, yay. Yeah, so that, that's, that's a, they do monthly meetings, whereas right now uh, the general membership does quarterly meetings. So anyway, it's, yeah, I am, I'm very interested in doing it and I, I accept it, so. Great, excellent. Um, they have so you'll have more to report <laughs> right. in the future. <laughs> Well, congratulations, we're oh, proud of you. you. Thank you. Um, the other, I'll just ask anyone, um, you can just speak out or anybody else here have something to report on uh, one of these? Yeah, I do uh, for the for CPAC. Okay, <clears throat> go ahead, Michael. Briefly, um, the uh, CPAC proposals uh, with the exception of the uh, library pres uh, 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 record preservation uh, were all approved by council last this week. Uh, they're, we're, the CPAC is meeting a Zoom meeting again, apparently next week, to review their proposal, of, uh, their uh, recommendation relative to the uh, library's uh, proposal. Uh, and there's some there's some um, um, need to uh, reconsider it, according to the uh, chair. So that's in process. So a decision, a vote will probably happen at that meeting. I imagine so. About what? Um, the uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The, the issue is whether or not the one million five hundred thousand dollar request for the library, which was subsequently reduced to one million, uh, which is earmarked for the uh, historic preservation of uh, the documents and the uh, special collections uh, material, uh, whether that is in fact legitimately a, a historic preservation request. Uh, there's some controversy as to about that, uh, and that's the that's the issue the uh, okay. the the uh, CPAC wants to resolve. Thank you. Looking forward to hearing how that outcome happens. Um, so, if there's no more committee or liaison reports, uh, I have no report of chair, report of staff. I'm ready to go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> So I think we can finish this meeting. It's 10, uh, 21. Uh, yes, yeah, third, fifth, everybody. So uh, that's nearly four hours. We had a lot in here. I'm so sorry. There's, we're just we're bogged good. up we're and good. we've got a lot to do, but thank you everyone. I appreciate no, no your problem. See you next time week. and effort. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you next, See you next week. week. Bye. Have a great Bye. one. Stay safe. Bye.